Greetings. I have coffee. All is good. It is five past midday in my part of the world. I was supposed to start at five, but I'm running on muso time. That's cool. That's cool. Because I assume we're all musos here. And uh, episode number 34. 34. They're flying by. And I don't freak out anymore. I used to completely freak out about this whole live thing, but I've come to realize train wreck happens. People like a train wreck. And um, sometimes cool people turn up at my door like, ding dong, who could that be? Let me have a look. It is Erwin Thomas. Hey, Erwin, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm doing okay, man. I'm doing okay. Thanks for joining me. Um, it's mate, a pleasure. We actually had a cool, cool moment uh, leading up to this where um, – I knew that Louis Shelton would be coming around to my place to just quickly upload something for him because his internet was down. And he uh, produced your second album with Southern Sun. So I quickly shot you a text and said, hey, man, if you phone in now, uh, it might be somebody here. How how cool was that? Yeah. Uh, Look, on a scale of one to ten, zero being dog shit and 10 being like one of the best things that ever could have happened. It was right up there with it, with a 10, let me tell you. That's just so like, I haven't seen Louis in a long time. Um, and like you say, he produced our second record. Uh, and I was just absolutely stoked. It's <laughs> just, so, I mean, you know, that uh, in the last couple of years, I've started playing that music again, like in a band form format, you know, and revisiting uh, that second record of ours um, has been quite enjoyable for me, um, and it's brought up a lot of lot of great memories. Um, so to get to see Louis today, yeah, he's he's one of those producers. Uh, I mean, it, look, he's just a beautiful cat for a start. That's totally that's, goes totally. without saying. Yep, he's an absolute monster of a player and uh like the legacy that that guy leaves you know behind that that is that precedes him is you know for those of you who did it who don't know who we're talking about get on it um and uh you know he's one of those cats that when when you're in the studio with him he makes you feel like you're capable of more than you think you are and he draws out of you something uh, that's that's greater than what you than what you think you can deliver, um, and as a musician in the studio, that is a, a a great experience because you create something in those moments that you know you get to reflect on for the rest of your life. Totally. And um, you know, I, he, there was many many moments like that on that second record for me, and he was very patient and. Um, and we spent we spent a lot of hours talking about guitar and 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 uh, his his session days playing with you know playing uh, you know on Jackson Five records and uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, the monk the monkeys and uh, you know his his guitar part on Last Train to Clarksville was still legendary one of the great absolutely guitar legendary yeah. of all time yeah all time. So oh, that I'm, was a real treat, so thank you. No problem, man. No problem. As I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll just shot you a text and said, hey, just phone in you know, 10 minutes earlier than, I, than expected and a little surprise for you. Yeah. But, mate, I'm going to start where I normally start with people. Um, well, mm-hmm. I usually ask people what got them hooked on the guitar and how they got into that crazy world. But I want to ask you something slightly different, man, because you're known as a singer as well as a guitar player. And when I was a teenager and people would ask me who my favorite guitar players were and, and I dropped the name Jack Jones, they're like, oh, like same name as the, the, the singer guy from Southern Suns. I'm like, no, no, the singer guy from Southern Suns. Yeah, he, he's an awesome guitar player. <laughs> so what came first, man? Was it guitar playing or singing? Yeah. Uh, look, look, my mum's got cassettes of, uh, of me at like two making up songs and like singing and um uh, but you know, but really, guitar was most. Well, it was cer- yeah, most cer- certainly was my first. Was the first thing I I wanted to be, like I wanted to be a session guitar player, a touring and session guitar player, maybe like an MD or that was my. Um, that was really my dream when I was growing up and when I was studying guitar. Um, and I always just thought if I could sing a bit, then that would probably get me a gig in someone's band 
above a guitar player that maybe couldn't sing. So that was really where singing was uh, in the hierarchy, uh, my hierarchy. But, um, and, you know, as fate would have it, uh, I ended up being the singer in this band that, you know, sort of blew up here. Um, and then, like, my that became my thing. And it was very, it took me decades to reconcile that, to just get comfortable with my voice. Because, you know, I always felt like I was punching way above my weight. Um, and, you know, because I because I put all this time into playing guitar, so I was fairly confident when it came to playing guitar. But when it came to singing, I was quite insecure. Wow. Um, and, yeah. uh, and it was an incredibly stressful time for me. A lot of the time, every... Everything I did every day was about like, having a voice that night, you know, yep. finish, finish the gig, straight home to bed, good night, see you later, no partying for this guy. Uh, it was always how much, you know, getting the most sleep I could, sleeping in the van, sleeping on the plane, sleeping in the bus, sleeping at the gig. Um, and, and there was always a sense of um, panic about whether I was going to have a voice. You know, for the most part, it always showed up. But, and, I've, and I've most certainly relaxed now, like, uh, with my voice and I feel like I've kind of grown into it um, for a long time it was this bucking bronco that I felt like I was really really struggling kind of to get a hold of and um, yeah in the last say 10 years maybe uh, maybe a little bit long maybe 15 years I feel like I've just started to enjoy that uh, you know enjoy the experience of singing and it's and I think as I moved from as I transitioned from sort of guitar player the songwriter or producer or, you know, as I moved through that sort of that arc, um, you know, my voice has become a diff, uh, you know, I've been able to write, uh, not for it, but it's a, you know, it's a real vehicle for, for being expressed. So now I can actually really enjoy what I'm doing with my voice and, and, uh, you know, appreciate the experience a bit more. But guitar was always, man, I'm so passionate about guitar. I That's fucking good. love guitar. Oh, don't we all? I don't it. we all? I'm just going to warn people. It. I'm just going to warn people because people do know you as a singer, and I'm sure there's going to be some fans right. here um, that this is a guitar nerd podcast. So we are going to get pretty techy with it, and they're probably going to go, what the hell does that mean? So my apologies to those people, but we did come here to geek out on guitar. Isn't that right? We. Well, that's exactly why I'm here, brother. <laughs> so what started Story. the journey? What started the journey guitar-wise for you, man? Because I've known about you since you were quite um, young. Yeah, okay. So when I, was, uh, when I was about two or three, we took a trip from uh, – I was born in, in New York. And my mother and I came back to Australia to spend some time with, um, you know, with, our, with the family. And we were in Honolulu and we – there's something wrong with my mother's. There was an issue with my mum's visa or something. We had to spend the night there. We had to, we got off the plane, had to spend the night, and mum took me to some sort of market. And there was a, there was a. It was like a little puppet that was like, sort of, playing ukulele. And anyway, its hair fell off. <laughs> <laughs> These are the funny things that just. Uh, but I decided then that I wanted a ukulele. I asked my mum for a ukulele, and. Um, and that was kind of where my, uh, I guess, uh, where my interest s sort of really kind of spiked. Um, but it wasn't until we moved here in uh, 81 and I started, um, I was about 11, I started taking like proper lessons with my, uh, with, you know, who, who became, you know, a, a very big mentor for me. My uh, first guitar teacher uh, by the name of Tony Calabro down in Gippsland, and he, um, you know, that was, that was really where I kind of, that's when I started to put the hours in, you know, started to, to, really, to really dig into playing guitar. And, um, and then it just kind of went from there. It was probably one of those things that really kept me out of uh, trouble. Cool. Big trouble. Yeah. You know, like it really, um, it was a real... It was a real game changer for me because it was something that I realized if, if I put time into it, everything that I invested in it, I would get back somehow. And, um, you know, it was, uh, 
it, it's just it's all, and I think it's just always kind of been that. It's it's been a real savior for me, uh, and I and I just it's so great to have something in your life that you're so passionate about, but you actually know you're never going to get to the end of it. Yeah, there's always always it's something like to learn, okay. isn't it? It's always something to learn. There's always hey. someone better than you out there. Oh. My God, I, you know, I get on the internet now and I see about four guys play guitar and I go, look, just stop doing this yep. because it's, it's mental. It's mental. So, you know, I, um, I, I feel very fortunate to have had that. And, you know, look, I've, I've been very fortunate uh, in my life. I've, been, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with some really great, great people over the years and I continue to have that, those opportunities and I love that. I love the fact that I get to be part of this little community of uh, – of artists and musicians that um that gets to have this kind of diverse and you know uh colorful really multicolored palette of experience like musical experiences everything from making my own records to playing doing sessions on other people's records to you know working with people like verge still over the years whether it's making southern sons records or his solo records yeah and uh and that stuff for me is just a it's just a beautiful um it's just a beautiful journey that keeps unfolding as we go. You know? Nice one. I love nice it. One. But guitar was the first. Guitar was really, guitar was, that was really the, 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 the beginning nice. you know, for me. Nice. I am going to warn people that, that Erwin is uh, very remote in the country, so he's had to, we're using some, holding our tongue just the right way and everything to, to actually get a connection right now. So if he seems a little glitchy at times, if he drops out, He'll he'll scope straight back in. I'll I'll keep talking and bumbling along until he does. But everything seems good to, to now. So Owen, you said at eleven you started taking lessons with Tony Calabro. What type of things were you mm -hmm. learning from Tony? So Tony's got this really broad curriculum, and it starts. He doesn't teach. Uh, I guess you know, like these days, it's it's like you know, you, you go on YouTube and it's like, hey, you know, do you want to play guitar? Have you ever played? Have you ever wanted to play guitar? Because you know you can learn to play guitar in like six easy lessons. Yeah. Um, no, Tony doesn't teach like that. Tony's Tony's intro to me was for the first year or two, you're going to be pretty bored. You're going to be wondering why am I doing this? This is slow, um, and you're not going to feel like you're getting anywhere, and you're going to have mates. To go and get guitar lessons off other guys and uh you know they're going to be learning all these songs they're going to be learning how to play all these songs yep. and you're not going to be learning that kind of stuff he goes but you wait if you stick with it you'll see this thing will happen where you'll just go and you're, you're just going to take you're going to break off from those guys he goes and you you, you it, and it's a very full full curriculum um which starts with learning very basic things. Um, and then it branches off into learning a bit of classical, learning some jazz, uh, harmony, and and all of a sudden you start going, huh, wow, okay. Uh, I start, you know, so I, look, there were times when I wanted to pack it in. I won't, you know, I, I, everyone, everyone speaks romantically about how they, you know, never wanted to give up playing guitar, bullshit. There are times that you just go, this is fucking really hard. And I, yeah. But once you press, push through those, you really start to, to bloom, you blossom, you know. So, so Tony's curriculum, that, that was pretty much, you know, everything from Matteo Kakasi, like classical guitar sort of stuff, to, to uh, Barry Gelbray, uh, you know, Bach Inventions, and, um, uh, you know, getting into kind of learning how to play standards and, you know, Tony's Tony's been written up in some pretty uh, heavy sort of music education um, publications about his teaching method, and it's pretty solid. Cool. Uh, you know, he was he was mates with Joe Pass and stuff, so you know he knows what he's doing. So a, a big part of that was just trusting him and yeah. listening to him, and 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 uh, look, there's only a couple of lessons that I had with him where he kind of put it on the line, like mate. I think I only got sent home a couple of times. Really? Yeah, and I did because you know there were a couple of weeks when I didn't put didn't do the homework. Yeah, and yeah, that's, yeah. And you know what? He just say to me, "Look, next time, just don't come because I'll spend this." His lessons go for twenty minutes. 
Wow. Straight to the point, huh? Like, it's us. You get in there, you get to it. Because, you know, and he would say, you know, if you haven't done the work, I'll spend that 20 minutes preparing for the next student who did do the work. Yeah, right. And that really used to, that really used, that got to me. I'd be like, oh, Mm. I've wasted his time, I've wasted yep. my mum's time, I've wasted her money, and and I love guitar. Yep. So if if I had a week where I rode my BMX a bit too much or whatever, or you know, and didn't put the time in, uh, you know, you knew about it. So, sure. but Man, I love that... I love Tony. We still we still chat with each other, you know, and he's he's a beautiful cat. He's still a, he's still one of my biggest champions, and nice. I, I love him dearly. Nice. You know? That's good to hear. Man, that's a very different story <laughs> to a lot of the people I talk to. Because most people are the learn to strum a few chords, play the everyone says folk music when they start out, and then you know I've got to ask them how they bridge right. over to playing uh, some some rock and roll. So that's that's mm. good to hear that you actually were schooled from a, from an early age. Um, mm-hmm. And I love I, I love that, and uh, it, you know it made it made it like when, by the time I was fourteen, I was in like. And I wouldn't say that when I'm going to say a fusion band, I wouldn't say that it was, it wasn't the Chicory electric band, hmm. but, but you know, I was playing, I was playing that kind of music. I was playing like top 40 music. I was in a big band, like in our local area, you know, reading charts. I was in a Latin percussion band called the Xenu. You like, we were playing, you know, kind of South American music. So I just had this deep love for music and I wanted to experience as much of it as I could in every sort of uh, genre. And um, I wanted to be a pretty well-rounded musician, again, because my dream was I want to be a session cat. I want to play on people's records. I want to go on tour with people. So, you know, if it's if it's Emmylou Harris or if it's Tina Arena or if it's John Farnham or if it's, you know, Richard Marks, whoever it is, I want to be able to to kind of move in and out of these worlds and um, and uh, and be a bit of a chameleon which is probably why it took me a little while to, to really nail my identity as a guitar player too. Same as a singer, I suppose. Yep, yep. Because I kind of have had a bit of a propensity to be able to be quite malleable. Um, so, you know, I think it took me a little longer to kind of just go into like my thing. Cool. Um, but there you go. That's now, the way it's rolled out. So wait, when, you, when you were starting out... Uh, what was the first guitar you had? I had, oh, actually, I can't remember what the brand of my first electric guitar was because, mm-hmm. uh, it, but it was a Les Paul, but it got, it quickly got exchanged for a Hagstrom. Um, and I had that guitar. I, I, I don't have that guitar anymore, but I had it for a long time. Yeah. Um, it, it was like a Hagstrom sort of strat kind of style guitar it was horrible it was but but as i got you know as i put the time in you know look my mum is just she is an extraordinary woman and she she was very she's always been my biggest fan and my biggest supporter um and she, you know she upped she she upgraded me as i put the time in you know she uh she uh, she got me some very nice guitars in those early years that really cool. kept me cool. kept me going, you know. Yeah, and what about yeah, amp? First guitar was the Hagstrom. Hagstrom, what, what amp? were you playing through amp Ah, oh. uh, busting the memory banks now, <laughs> mate. I've gone through everything. Um, yeah. I've owned them all. Well, speaking uh, of that, I just saw Bruce Egnator is in the, the chat, and he he wanted to know if you still have. What? Your your IE four. Uh, just if I go back through Bruce Egnator, can't stay now, but want to know if Irwin had the first green Egnator IE four preamp. Yeah, I I don't have that anymore, and it's one of my. I have like three gear regrets in my life, um, and it's I don't know what's more embarrassing: the fact that I fell on hard times and had to get rid of it, or that I that that's what I got rid of. But I that was an absolutely like I loved that preamp. Like I loved that preamp. I know where it is still. I still know where that is. Oh to wow! This day. Wow! I um I've kept my eye on it in case it ever it ever comes up for sale again. Cool. Um and and you know 
Proust, he is, he's one of those, well, you you know Bruce, so he's one of the good guys in in this business. He is one of those guys that's just, you know, uh, I remember when I, when I first met him and, um, and he was just such a nice, such a nice guy. And he's ferocious. Like, that guy, I mean, I can't tell you some of the things that some of the, I can't tell you some of the issues that he's fixed of other people's things. Oh, really? Like, design, oh, design yep. things that he is, has done over the years. But he's a very clever fellow. And, and um, yeah, look, I hope we cross paths again uh, in the, well, when we're able to, to get on planes and go from you know country to country again. Cool. But I, cool. unfortunately, I don't have that preamp, and I and it, um, it's one of my it's one of my gear regrets. Mm. One of my one of my gear regrets. That least... that and a, and a couple of guitars that I that I sold um, yeah. around the, the same time actually. Um, sure, sure. So I did jump a bit there, yeah, mate. I just wanted to bring I, that up. I, I wanted Bruce. to bring that up quickly because I saw that that Bruce said that he, he couldn't stay long, so I thought I'd just throw that in now. While if if he was still here, but you were talking, I was asking well, you about the first amp that you possibly played the Hagstrom through. Yeah. Can you look, think what I, that was? I, I don't know what my first amp was. I, I went through a bunch of, um, early in the piece, I went through a bunch of different amps. Like it was probably like a Roland cube. Yep. Yep. It would have, it would have been something like that. And then I would have gone to like a JC 120. And then I probably would have gone like. Then I would have gone to a, like a Fender Super Reverb, like a four ten. That would have been when I started going, ooh, ooh, this, this has a, a sound, you know. Yeah. And then I think as I as I kind of evolved, then then maybe like a boogie. I, remember, I used to have a boogie Mark II C with a fifteen inch speaker. Wow. Yeah, and that was a very nice amp um that was a great that was a great amp and then i started you know then i kind of went to the the marshals i've you know i've been a bit of a slut with gear over the years yes you have yes you have i really you know i've always been on that search that was that was something um that made that anyway i don't want to keep harping on that preamp because i i'm hurting right Mm. now but um (laughs) there is a he is reissuing it soon he is reissuing it soon. If you didn't know that, yeah. Well, I want to jump on that. I, I might, I might put an order in for a custom color one of one of those when he when he does that. And if you're still there, Bruce, don't give up on me. <laughs> so, Owen, <laughs> I was. You said you started at eleven. Now, I was aware of you when you were yeah. quite young because you played uh, in a, a Van Halen tribute band called Hans Valen. And when I was mm. a youngster, I'd, I'd heard of this kid, Jack, mm. playing uh, mm. in, in Hans Valen. How did you get from the lessons with Tony to being okay. good enough at – how old were you when you joined Hans Valen? All right. This could be a 25-minute story. That's fine. Because That's fine. Because there's, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's a big thing that happened yep. that was really quite transformative for me. Like it was a really – it was a pretty cataclysmic experience that really um, that really set things in motion for me, which led me to that time. Cool. Um, and it's something that I don't that I haven't really had the opportunity to talk about with anybody. So, but here here it is. When I was fourteen, I used to take the train to Melbourne every Saturday morning. And I used to hang out because I was in the country. And I used to hang out in like Brashes, Allens. There was, a, there was a music store in the city called Davis Music. And, um, and I used to just go and hang out in these music stores. Like I was just a kid. Oh, my ear, ear piece falling out. So, pardon me. Um, so I was just a, yeah, I was just, a, just this little pimple faced kid from the country. He used to go into Melbourne, like take the train. Into, I don't, I, if I, I wouldn't let my kid do that. <laughs> There is no way in a million years I'd let my kid do that. But anyway, I did it. And, um, and I met, I used to, I eventually, I guess, just started meeting guys that worked in these, these stores, right? I have to remind myself that we're getting to the 
Hands Valen story. So yep. Yep. Because it's gonna we're gonna we're gonna go like way off and then we come back. So I met a guy named um, Jeff Wright. He's a lovely guitar player. He used to play with Doug Parkinson um, and many many others. Uh, he's a lovely guitar player. Um, he and Scott Kingman, and I can't remember if it was Allen's. I think it was Allen's, but it might have been Brad. I can't remember. I think it might have been Brackers. I can't remember. Um, but they used to work there. Now, for those of you who don't know who Scott Kingman is, isn't a band called Horsehead. Mm. If you don't know who Horsehead is, you better go and investigate because that was a they were a big band for me when I was growing up too. But anyway, I digress. Jeff, one day Jeff goes, there's this band called The Cutters and they're looking for a guitar player. And uh, he goes, they, they've already got a guitar player who's like the singer-songwriter in that band. He's a guy by the name of Phil Buckle. And he, Jeff, I will never forget Jeff saying to this to me, he was like, he plays like this really crazy, you know, legato style, you know. And I was like, and he goes, they're looking for a guitar player. I'm 14, man. Like, anyway, my mum takes me. My mum and my stepdad take me to, to Melbourne to audition for this guy named Peter Hoyland. Uh-huh. Jeff gives me Peter's number uh-huh. and says, call this guy, you know. So, of course, I just, we just call him. I'll call him up. Yeah. So at that stage, I had a 335, a Roland, like, little pedal board and a cube. And <laughs> the management company of the cutters owned some um some nightclub they owned the grain store tavern the metro and a place called inflation anyway i met peter my mother in inflation i think i played something like broken wings and like gave him some you know demo tape that we made uh on a reel to reel at my uncle's place up in a lounge room like and we'd recorded me probably singing um uh night owl you know, LRB or something like that. Yep. Uh, and I may have, I may have sung a Peter Couple song as well. So he was a massive influence on me. Anyway, I, I love this story because it's just, it reminds me of, of, you know, if you just believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing, the, the universe conspires to, to come through for you. You know. Yes, it does. So I did this, I did this audition and um. And, you know, I waited with bated breath by the phone for that phone call, you know. And, of course, the phone call came. And guess what? I didn't get the gig because I was 14. I wasn't old enough to get into the fucking venues. Yeah, sure. Like, you know, and these guys must have been thinking, what are we going to do with this kid? Like, anyway, the funny thing was, was Reggie, Reggie Bowman got the job in that band. And that band became the state. Uh huh. We'll get back to this in a minute. Yep. So anyway, I was like, I was heartbroken. I was devastated. I was absolutely gutted. And I ended up going to America for a few months. And I studied a bit of guitar with a guy named Christian Foley Beeling, with who te- taught at MI. Um, but let me just go back a little bit, little bit before that. I was in Adelaide with some family friends and we'd gone to see Lionel Richie and Carlos Rios was playing guitar and was his, his MD. For those of you who don't know who Carlos Rios is, he's a bit harder to find on the internet, but you'll find him. Um, anyway, I was blown away. There was a guy named Michael Ruff that was playing keyboards in the band as well, who I investigated a lot and, and sort of delved into his music later. Anyway, um, so we saw the concert. We found out they were staying at the Hilton in Adelaide. And we went there the next morning because we knew that they'd be leaving to wherever else, they, wherever they were going. And we waited in the foyer. And they came down. They're having breakfast. So I go over and introduce myself to Carlos, right? Again, I'm this little 14-year-old kid, you know, 
saying, hey, you know, I'm studying guitar, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and you know what? He just grabs a napkin and he writes his name, his address, wow. his phone number. I'm going to cry because <laughs> it was just, you know, these things change your life. Absolutely. And it only got better. It only got better from here. Like, so he hands me this, this napkin and uh, I reckon I've probably still got it somewhere, to be honest yeah. with you, 35 years later or whatever. Oh, yeah, I reckon I've still got it somewhere. Um, and, uh, and he goes, hey, if you're ever in LA, give me a call. Six months later, after you're in LA. not getting the gig in, I'm in LA. And he picks up the phone. And I think he shit himself. I think he thought, what have I done? This kid is in LA. Like... He, sh- he, he came like, you know, you've got to remember there was no internet. There was no mobile phones. There was no, you know, it was a different world. Anyway, he invites me. He goes, I'm doing a session tomorrow. He goes, I've got this guitar player coming in who I think you'll really enjoy. His name's Mike Landau. Uh, he's playing on this, on this track for me. He was producing an album for a guy named Ruben Blades, South American actor sort of slash singer. I think the album was called The Hit. That was the song I think that he was, that he was playing on anyway. Um, man, it's taking me back. <laughs> so, so I show up at this session and I'm sitting in the back, you know, like by then I'm 15. Now I'm 15. And uh, Mike's playing, he's doing his thing and, he, and then something happens and he turns around and he goes, hey, uh, do you mind playing a couple of things on my guitar i think i'm gonna check my speakers so i picked this guitar up mate i i don't know what i played but i i i have this feeling that i just crumbled like that i just didn't like know even what to play so sure. funny because yeah yeah i was just so green i'm so fucking green and he came in and he goes hey nice licks man like and he grabbed, took his guitar and finished the session that built that really did the, the world a good for me you know i just not got this sort of this sort of dream gig. And, you know, I knew that Virgil was in the cutters, like, and I'd seen him on uh, the Don Burroughs collection with Linda Cable, like, and I was like, I'm going to play in a band with that guy one day. I'm going to play in a band with that guy one day. And of course that opportunity had passed. And I thought, Oh fuck, this is, that was it. Like, so then I find myself in LA at this session. Crazy thing was, was at the end of that session, um, this guy comes in and Carlos goes, oh, you know, he's having a chat with this guy and he introduces him to me. The guy was Al Schmidt. Now he produced and uh, he produced Sleepwalk, Larry Carlton's Sleepwalk record. Wow. I mean, that was like the biggest record of my life at the time. Like yeah. it was just, you know, Abe Senior, Jeff Picaro. I've lit up like a Christmas tree here, mate. I've got goosebumps like everywhere. It was just... Cool. It was a phenomenal. I'm sitting in the back of this studio, just little this kid, you know. And uh, anyway, he and Al have a have a chat. I was like, you know, see you later. And then another guy walks in, and he says, uh, "I got some. Uh, we got, you know." Uh, Carlos introduces me and says, "This is Larry." You know, I go, "Larry, you know, yeah, great, nice to meet you." And um, he goes, "I've got some songs, you know, from the new from the new Joni record to play." You want to hear them? So Carlos was like, "Yeah, bust, bust him out, man!" Like, and he starts playing some um, some Joni songs. Wow, Joni Mitchell, Larry Klein. So I'm thinking, this is just beyond. Like my mind is <laughs> like it's, it's <laughs> totally. ridiculous. Totally, is, is this happening? Yeah. Is this happening? You know, and um. And look, there's another side to aspect to this story, which I won't go into, but I was staying at um, this place and where I was staying, uh, I was staying at my, uh, my older, I've got an older half brother and I was staying at his place and he hadn't shown up for a while. And, uh, and I was kind of stranded. This is in LA. Anyway, we finished the session. We go out to dinner. Carlos, Carlos takes me back to his place. <laughs> And we go out, out to dinner and, um, and he's got a lady friend with him, you know. 
I can't imagine what the conversations that must have been going on in the background. Like, who is this kid? With yeah, Gala? yeah, cool. Like, who's this? Who's this little kid that that's you know this teenager? Not little kid, but who's this teenager that like talks funny? Like, what's what's the deal, man? Like, uh, anyway, we went out for dinner, and as and he, as he was driving me home. The girl that was the lady that was with him said, "Hey, honey, you know, do you mind if I use your bathroom?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." And I think he sent her up to check on me, yeah. like just to make sure that everything was just cool, like because yep. he knew nothing about, like you know. Um, and you know, I had to be pretty creative during that time. I spent it. I spent the first week and a half by myself in this apartment in LA. I didn't know anybody except Carlos, and I was the kind of I was the kind of kid that wouldn't ask for help. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, Hey, I'm really lonely or Hey, you know, uh, where can I cash a traveler's check? Hey, I don't have any groceries. Hey, um, I don't, you know, how do I survive here with nobody, you know? Yep. So I kind of had to improvise and, 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 and figure my, figure my shit out. Um, so it was a pretty scary but incredibly inspiring time. I was just practicing every day. And I'd call Carlos up and I'd say, hey, like, do you have any tips on practicing? You know, and he'd say, yeah, why don't you just try playing in one position over a whole bunch of different chords? Just go, he'd just say, just play a bunch of different chords everywhere, but try to not move from where you are. Now, going back to Carlos, I mean, he played on Gino Vanelli's Brother to Brother record. He played on the Chicory Electric Band, the first, that first Chicory um, first chick record it's phenomenal phenomenal guitar player and a huge influence on on me he studied a bit well i don't know if he studied with larry carlton but he learned a lot off larry and he's a lefty so he always used to say to me it was really great learning like playing with larry because it was like looking in a mirror a mirror yeah yeah you know it's like you could you could really cop what the other guy was doing because you could cool. really kind of see it yep anyway I then ended up doing some work with a guy named Don Ciccone, who was, um, who became a very, very close family friend and a dear mentor for me. He was in a band in the 60s called The Critters. Cool. And, um, and then he ended up, ended up with Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. And, um, you know, he, he, was, he had a pretty, pretty solid career. Um, and we did some demos together in, in, uh, on the East Coast. And anyway, I came back to Australia after that adventure and it was an adventure like it was a real it was a real adventure um so i came back at you know i guess 50 i was i was approaching sort of the it was the end of my 15th year and uh come 16 i kind of just i got it i don't know how i got this i don't know how this came up but there was an audition for a cover band called survival in melbourne and they were like a bit of an institution, you know. Heaps of people had been through that band that went on to to do other things, you know, Boom Crash Opera, this that, you know, like a lot of lot of. It was a bit of an institution in that in that respect, you know. So anyway, I'd get the train up, I auditioned, I got the I took the train up, I auditioned, and I got the gig. And I, it's funny because, the guy who hired me, Andrew Rigetti. He lives not very, not that far away from me now. We both travelled all over the world, lived in all these different places, and now we sort of live actually quite close together. Cool. I saw him only a week and a half ago, a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, don't worry, I'm going to get to this. I'm yeah, you're right, man. You talk away, talk away. That's what we're here for. So, so, okay, so I, so I get this gig. Uh, Rick Evans, the drummer, is still a dear friend of mine. He, uh. You know, I'm sleeping at his house on the couch. Uh, you know, we're we're playing in in you know doing gigs around town, whatever. And you know, I went from there to another band called Get Off the Cat. And while I was in Get Off the Cat, I um I get a call from this guy, and he goes, "Hi, it's Virgil Donati," and I'm like, "What?" Like, I couldn't believe it. He goes, I hear you're a singer. Um, I hear you're a singer, and I'm putting this Van Halen cover band together, and I was wondering if you'd like to audition for it. And my immediate 
my immediate reaction was, I'm not a singer. I don't know who told, like, who misinformed you that I'm a singer, but I'm not. I'm actually a guitar player. I said, do you have a guitar player in the band? Like, has that position been filled? And he goes, well, it kind of has, but if you'd like to come and audition, come along, come and have a play. And I was like, okay, uh, sure. So that's how I got the gig with Virgil. And at like the first... You know, that's how I got my first gig with Virgil. And look, I would have done anything to play in a band with that guy. He's another one of those people like Louis that that believes in you so much that um, that whenever you engage with him on a musical uh, project, you always end up delivering more than you feel like you could ever have delivered. And you, and you look back on it and go, wow, he really drew that out of me. And he wow. believes in me. And, um, and, you know, from then, from then till now, I still have that relationship, Virgil, you know, like I, I, and I still have to pinch myself every time Virg asks me to do something, I try to do it because I just think, oh my God, I just, you know, I love working with this guy. And then I have this moment of sheer panic and regret <laughs> and I, I'm in terror, terror, because I think, holy shit, what's, what? What have I signed up for? Like, because whatever this is, is it's going to be, it's it's intimidating. And then you do it, and you go, I'm so glad I did it. Like, oh wow, I accomplished something. Um. So that was pretty much how I ended up in a band with Virgil Donati. Cool. And then one day at a sound check, we were playing at the Palace in Melbourne. Our singer was crook. It's such a cliche story, but this is the honest to God's truth. Yeah. Our singer was sick, and I sang a couple of songs at soundcheck just to check the mic. Virgil, now, now mind you, there's been no talk this whole time that I've been in Hans Valen about the Cutters, the State, Virgil's original life, like project life. Like, no talk about that. No, I'd never said to him, you know what, I auditioned for a band when I was 14. That you, like, none of that. Virgil says, come out to the car. I want to play you some stuff. Bangs in a cassette and he plays me some songs. And it's the state. Cool. And it's new music. He goes, we might be looking for a lead singer. I don't think Phil wants to do this part of this role anymore. And we just want to kind of freshen things up a bit. Um, are you interested in coming down and having to sing, sing some songs in the studio one day as like an audition. I said, sure, why not? I've still got that cassette somewhere. That I, the, I still have it yeah. of, those, of those songs that I I've sang. still got a, I've still got a state, I've final. still got a state cassette somewhere. I was thinking I should have grabbed it before. Have you? Yeah, I do. Oh, man, of Elementary? Yeah. yeah. Elementary? Yeah, that, absolutely. Oh, I love, love that record. I still listen, I still listen to that record probably without exaggerating, like, I probably listen to that record once a month. I love it. I re love it. revisit. Oh, yeah. some great songs. So you were saying you had a tape of the new stuff. Well, I I went into the studio and excuse me, uh, and recorded I've got a, a coffee bean. Coffee bean in my mouth. <laughs> um, so that's that's my drug of choice these days, caffeine. Um, so I sang these, I think it was about five songs. Hold on to the memory was one fight. It was another, but didn't even make it on the record. Um, and a couple of other songs, a few other songs. Um, anyway, it, you know, I got the call that, that we were going to do this. It was like, are you in, you know, we went out for dinner. We all hung out together and, and I thought, you know what, if I've got to be a singer in a band with Virgil Tonardi, then fuck it. I'll sing in the band. Cool. Because I'll do anything to play in a band with this guy. Um, Let alone Phil Buckle. That's how it Let out. alone Phil Buckle on guitar as well, well man. Fuck me. And I, I learned so much from, from those cats. Like, you know, and, and Reggie, like, it was so, it was so serendipitous. You know, it, we came completely full circle and they didn't even know anything about it. Like, they didn't, they had, 
it wasn't it wasn't till years later that that conversation ever even came up that I'd auditioned for the band when I was well, whatever. But and when it came up, the guys were like, "Really? I didn't think H even mentioned that to us." You know, wow. H was like, "I fucking did so," wow. you know. But you know, who knows? Who knows how how it played out? It didn't really matter by that stage. We, I was in, and we were doing it. You know. Yeah. Um, and that changed the trajectory of of uh of my career and my life like immensely it was wow. it, uh you know because I, and I and there was always a, a an inner sort of dissonance because you know i'll never forget getting a, a phone message from john farnham because at that stage you know phil was writing songs with john i think the record company was getting a bit I don't know what you want to call it. I, I'm reluctant to use words like stale or, uh, but they just, I think they, look, I love the state. Let me preface this with, I love the state. Yep. It, they were just a great band. I didn't think they needed anything, but obviously uh, there was, there was some conversations about them wanting something different. And Phil had been writing a bunch of songs for John at the time with John for John. And, uh, you know, of course, I was a massive Brett Garstead fan. Mm -hmm. Like, that guy changed my... And, you know, the other thing was, when I was about 16 or 17, I'd done this piss tape with the D-Generation. It was called Five in a Row. And I remember I that. did the John Farnham part. Yeah, right? yeah. As a, I was just taking the piss. Like, I played the guitars on that and did the John Farnham bit. And, yep. And then when I was about 16... In Taralgon, John did a New Year's Eve at the. Uh, God, I'm tr I'm jumping all over the top. You're right, man. You're John right. Played at our local, our local. Uh, it was like a New Year's Eve gig or whatever. And I ended up hanging out with Brett, meeting him that night. Yeah. And Brett introduced me to John. He goes, "This is this is the guy. This is the guy that that, that did that, John." I thought, well, I'm never going to work in his fucking band. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then and then you know two years later, two years later, I'm getting a message on my answering machine. And it's John Farnham saying, G'day, mate, no, just wanted to uh, just wanted to wish you the best and you know, think you're great and blah blah blah. And I remember listening to that and just going, Holy shit, like this is fucking happening. This is real, man. Like and then, you know, then we're in a big studio, we're making this record. Um, two of the big songs off that record came late. And uh, our, that was our first single, Heart and Danger, which was pretty much the song that, that put us on the map. And really, I mean, talk about trajectories. Mm -hmm. That changed the trajectory of that band's life. You know, that really, that was a big song for us. And then, uh, so, but that was a new song. Always and Ever was already there. And then Hold Me In Your Arms came along. And, um, and you know, I've never, I've never had the experience of... Um, of like singing a song, like you know, when when I was when we were recording those songs initially, there was a great vibe amongst the band and the record company and everyone. It was like this fresh new blood and and it, there was a real um, a new sense of possibility and and um, you know and, and excitement um, and anticipation because everyone felt like this record was really going to do do well, you know. And then when we would, when we recorded "Hold Me in Your Arms," I've never walked into a control room and had like five grown men like wiping their eyes, going, "Wow, yeah, just, wow! Yeah. How, how about how about the uh, how about the footy last night, guys?" And, uh, <laughs> you know, like it was a really, it was a really powerful experience, and I think that was when I first sort of realised, "Wow, you know, you, you might have something here with that voice of yours. You might actually have something that's a, you know, that you can use to communicate with people as well as your guitar playing, but." You know, singing is such a such a much more universal thing. You know, and and again, there was dissonance inside of me because I always thought that I wanted to have that effect on people as a guitar player. Mm -hmm. But of course, when it came time to play solos in that band, it was like Heart and Danger. Jonesy, take the second solo. Phil's doing the first slide solo. You go for the second one. And all of a sudden, you know, I got to sort of, I guess, I felt validated. Because I felt like I got to be expressed as a guitar player in that band. Cool. However, most people still, you know, 
that sometimes that connection isn't always isn't always made with a lot of people. Mm. Um, it was a it was a very very magical time and and you know like I said earlier, look, I would have done anything to play in a band with Verge, and to to, to just be in a in such a great um, musical ensemble. I mean that sounds so, but you know like to to just it was surreal. It was like a dream, but it wasn't a dream. It was what was happening. It was it was real, you know. Wow. And uh, and I still have to pinch myself, like, and you know, Phil and I after the band broke up, Phil and I didn't talk for a long time, and we've only recently started kind of, you know, uh, reconnecting because I had to get him to teach me how to play all these crazy tunings for these songs because we were going out on the road and I needed to learn how to play all the, um, you know. I needed to, to learn all the different shapes and Phil's tunings, you know, Phil's a big Joni Mitchell fan. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, she uses, she uses some very intricate tunings. Uh, you were there and, and always and ever, um, in particular, are this, this very weird C tuning. Um, and then there's an open D tuning. He uses a lot. Songs like Lead Me to Water and Hold Me In Your Arms. Anyway, it was, um, it was a real, uh, it was a real eye opener for me, and to have the opportunity to play in a band with Verge, you know, I was just going to take it. And that was some of the that was some of the that was some of the greatest musical um, some of the greatest musical experiences, you know, to date. Really, were um, were you know, I've had I've had some other pretty pretty fun ones since then. But yeah, yeah. That well, was, what a that story, was man! A big, big time for me. What a story! I was story. a kid, man. Totally. I was a fucking kid. Yeah. So like, yeah, I was eighteen we're... when I joined that band. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I got to say, um, yeah, I mean, I, I knew you guys through the singles uh, on the radio, but man, I used to go uh, to like try and hear you guys at sound check and all that kind of thing. I, I was I was that kid that was sort of outside listening, going, "No way, listen to that!" Um, I can remember yeah. you guys playing on on MTV, the basement tapes, I think they used to call it, oh, and yeah. you guys yeah. doing doing the state song, make a move, and then you and Phil like, trading oh, licks, yeah. man. Oh, that was just fucking awesome. Um, and, yeah, yeah, like, you're doing the yeah. whole, yeah, with a pick, doing your, your sweet picking thing. But then along comes Phil with his fingers sort of doing this thing. I'm like, oh, my God. what the fuck is that? Like, he's like a spider, man. He, he used to tell a great story about, because um, he met Brett early in the piece. The state was doing a gig in Castle, Maine. Yep. And I think Brett's band was... Uh, was opening for them. Yep. And Phil said he remembers walking into the gig. And so he walks into the room and the guitar player's got his guitar behind his head and he's playing. So Phil can only see a guitar and the back yeah. of someone. Yeah. And it was Brett. Wow. And he said, he goes, I shit myself. He goes, I was like, who is this? Yeah. You know, who, where, where did this guy come from? He's an alien. Brett's one of those cats, man. God, I love that guy. I, I just, I oh, have so much love. What a nice guy! For, I had know, him on. I had him on last week. He's a, and uh, oh, he he actually brought up he actually brought up meeting Phil, hearing Phil playing in a music store is what he said was the first time he heard Phil, oh, and yeah, was just right. like, well, there, well, wow, listen to this guy. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yep. And I mean, that, 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 there there are a few guitar players really, really that that within a few notes. You go, I know who that is. Yep. There's Angus Young, mm-hmm. you know, Larry Carlton, Robin Ford, those cats, Brian May. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a few others, but, but there's, there's not that many guitar players that they play a few notes and you know exactly who they are. The thing about Brett is he's one of those cats. He's one of those guys. Uh, Doug's one of those guys too, Rappaport. The way he attacks the guitar, you just know that it's him, and that's a hard thing to to really to to really develop. You know, you can go on the internet and hear guys play things that that are humanly impossible for most mortals. Yeah, and yet, and yet, you know what? And I I, I don't mean to sound critical when I say this because I'm talking about a level of guitar playing that I that is above my pay grade. You yep. know. Yep. Um, but it, but in in many ways it can be quite forgettable. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't. It, it's after you've heard a couple of minutes of it, you're just like, oh, 
but, you know. I, I wouldn't I couldn't tell who that person was, yeah. you know. And to me that's a really yeah. important thing when it comes to playing an instrument, whether it's your voice or whether it's you know, whatever instrument you play. Yep. You've got to have your voice, your signature. Absolutely. And um and Brett Brett's one of those guys that and the the funny thing is, man, is you can pick a guy that that has fucking studied Brett and in three notes you know that it isn't Brett, but you know that that guy has modeled his playing on him. Totally. It's it's phenomenal that the the, the level of um the, the volume of that of his voice on the instrument it's inc- the, the, the the his flavor is so strong it's mm. just magnificent his slide and, um, playing his slide playing for me is when he oh becomes my really God, melodic don't even get me yeah don't yeah. even get me started yeah. i messaged i messaged Sean Tubbs ages ago and um, cuz he was talking about slide or or doing something and i said hey man have you heard of this guy you should check him out and just recently i saw a thing that Brett did particularly how he does those double stop slide things. Yep. Like it, I play slide like I'm playing with my foot. Yep. Same. Like I, I, I just, I put a slide on and I just fucking throw it off. I go, you know what? I just don't have that kind of time anymore. Yep. However, I, I absolutely love that. Uh, it's such an expressive um, way of playing guitar. And, you know, Derek trucks is one of my favorite guitar players. Like, oh yeah. Of all time. Yep. He's just, you know, Talk about expressive, you know. And um, but anyway, Brett, Brett just, uh, you know, he never ceases to amaze me. We just did this this Southern Suns reunion um, tour with One Electric Day back over over just be- just before Christmas, and um, and you know, Brett and I had threatened each other th- that we were going to be hanging out, like, and we never we didn't get to because I was on at the beginning of the day and they were on at the end of the day, and for the most part, we didn't really get to see each other play. However, he he stuck around for a couple of our shows and I, and I stuck around to see as many of those shows as I could too. I mean, I always love listening to John and, and I, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a video of Brett playing a solo in, um, God, T- trouble was one of them. And the other one, I can't remember the other one. And I, I took the video while he was playing and then I sent it to him during the gig. Yeah. And I just was like, get fucked. Like, that, you didn't just do that. Seriously? <laughs> you just did that? What? Are you kidding me? Wow. You mental? Like, you can't do that. People are going to get hurt. Like, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was, oh, anyway, I, just, I love that guy. He's, he's always been consistent with me as a human. Like, he's always been a consistent human. And, um, and he never, and he's, you know, he's the most humble cat. Like, I don't. I probably don't know a more self-deprecating guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, and I just think Bransky, like you, you know, he's he's ferocious. He's a monster. Yeah, he's an absolute monster. Yep. And um and uh, I feel you know it's, I'm humbled whenever I get to hang out with those guys and and um and uh, just just even if it's just shooting the shit, you know, yep. I can just just um you don't even have to be playing guitar, although. You know, I, I get scared when I pick up a guitar around that guy. I bet it's like Tommy. Yeah, you know, it's like it's like it's like Tommy. You know, people, when, when you're around Tommy and someone says, "Do you play guitar?" You kind of go, "No, oh, I think, I, dude, I play a little bit of guitar." I I had a photo shoot with Tommy back in '91. I won the under 18 section of a uh-huh. guitar competition around here, and um, that was in 1990. In '91, he was in town, and I get this phone call at work. Hey, meet up with Tom. Basement of uh, sorry, the foyer. Of GCI, I get there and get these photos with him and he grabs his guitar out of the case and he goes to hand it to me. I have a play. I just looked at him and said, yeah, no. <laughs> what do you play in front of that guy? What do you play in front of that guy? It's, yeah, not yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and look, I, Tommy's another guy. Any opportunity I get to, to uh, last time, I'm not like, uh, yeah, the last uh, the last time I was in New York, just before I came back to Australia, um, a dear mate of mine, James Maddock, beautiful singer-songwriter, lovely guitar player, um, we were hanging out and uh, and he and I did a little pilgrimage on the train to go and see Tommy and Rick 
Rick was um, Rick and I had just made the California Dreaming record. Yeah, Rick Price. And um, yeah, Rick. Yeah, Rick Price. Sorry, <laughs> Rick. Um, and uh, and we all did a couple of songs together. The three of us, you know, had a little play in it and I had a bit of a sing. And uh, I got off stage and I burst into tears. <laughs> like, I just, uh, and Rick Rick came up to me, fuck, I'm going to cry now. <laughs> Rick came up to me and gave me a hug and he said, mate, are you all right? <laughs> and I was like, sometimes I just have to, you know, sometimes I've just got to pinch myself yeah. and, and, and just remind myself that I'm actually, this is my life. This mm-hmm. is the life that I'm that I'm living, you know, because sometimes you just feel so, um, you know, we just, because you're constantly doing things, you know, you're yeah. moving, moving from this project to this project, you're writing, you're producing, you're playing with someone, you're playing on someone's thing, whatever. And, um, and you forget that you have this history with these, these guys that you really admire. Yeah. And, and, you know, I have huge respect for those cats and, and to be invited to participate, <clears throat> um, it fucking blows me away. You know, yeah. it really, it really, yeah. it really, it really, uh, it really has an effect on me. And it has more of an effect the older I get for some strange reason. I'm not yeah. sure what, what's going on there. But, but I just, you know, I just feel very, very, very lucky. And, um, man, and I keep, you, you say lucky. To- you, you say lucky. You, you've set this up for yourself. I, I watched a, a great, mm. um, talk with Steve Vai on the True Fire site um, and he's talking about his three-step manifestation process of how to make shit happen for yourself and what you've described uh-huh. is you've totally done that you knew what you wanted to do you knew you wanted to be a guitar player a session guy you mm-hmm. you aligned yourself to let to allow that to happen you you know got to know all these guys and, mm-hmm. and hung out in those circles introduced yourself at that early age and then you practice the fuck mm-hmm. out of it to get to the level that you needed to be. You manifested it, man. Mm. It's a classic example. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I com- and you know what? As egotistical as it might sound, I completely agree with you. Like, uh, and, yet, um, and, and yet, it still blows me away. Yeah. It still blows me away that, totally. that, um, that, that you, know, you have these thoughts and they become things and you're really – and you're right. You know? Look, Ron Lee said to me once, he goes – Luck is when preparation and opportunity meet. Hmm. And I was like, huh. So if you just do the work, you kind of make your own luck in a way. Yep. You create it. Yep. And, you know, Doug was talking the other day about, you know, certain cats that um, it's like, how do these cats, some of these guys get these gigs, like, that sell themselves really well and network really well. And they're not particularly great players, some of these guys, you know, yep. but they get these gigs. And um, and I think that's just another kind of uh, it's another version of it. Like it's just, but when you when you dug, people will find you. Mm-hmm. You don't need to, you know, you don't, don't he doesn't need to be a great networker. He'll do all right. <laughs> so <laughs> Irwin, just fine. Irwin, we talked about you know? getting getting to um, you know, um, Southern Suns and all that. How how all that happened. How did you score the gig with Farnham? Well, that was that was pretty much an allegiance between it. Look, it just in some ways it made a lot of sense. Brett had had um, gone to America, and I think he was doing Nelson yep. around that time. Mm-hmm. So John was kind of John was down a guitar player, and let's face it, you can't replace Brett Garcid with one guitar player. That's right. So, so uh, you know, it took two of us to fill his fill those <laughs> boots, and I think it just made sense. You know, we were opening that that chain reaction tour was us, Sam Brown, and John Farnham. So, it it was, it, look, it was a very gracious move on John's part. It was strategic, I guess, because you know the record company had both of us, and you know they were trying to break. We were trying to break through, and. Um, we were going to be on the road anyway. So, uh, you know, Phil and I ended up uh, playing in John's band. Uh, and that was, that, was a pretty, that was pretty much how that sort of uh, just rolled out. Cool. Um, 
that was a that was a just a, another magical kind of time, you know. And and after that, after that, I I went to America. I think I was about twenty one. <laughs> and uh, and that's that's when I I went to L.A. and that's when I met the Dave Friedmans, the Joey Braslers, the Mike Landau's, the Reinhold Bogners, like the Andy Browers, like. That was when, when that sort of world opened up for me, and and uh, we did a actually we did a um. <laughs> I just recently found this footage on the internet, right? It's someone's high eight footage, or you know, like of backstage, or the backstage area at this massive festival in Europe, Toto Sting. Um, I don't know if I've got his name right, Enzo Ramazzotti or some, one of those guys. Yeah. Um, hot House Flowers. Uh, anyway, I'd done a, I'll, we'd done a tour with John, um, a quick European run. The first few shows were with ZZ Top and Brian Adams. Wow. And then we did these other shows, which were like multi-band sort of festivals. And I'm on this footage backstage. Someone comes, and that was where I met Jeff Beccaro. That's where I met Steve Lukather. I'll never forget meeting Steve because I'd been to LA. I bought all this gear, you know. I'd, I'd gone crazy. I had a little bit of money, and, and you know, it's like buy a house or a guitar rig. <laughs> house you know i mean I, I i say that like i had you know like it wasn't that much money yeah but it was like you know have a deposit for a house or buy a guitar sure sure of course of course i went and bought an slo 100 i put a i put a um deposit on that's when i put the deposit on the eggnator i put the deposit on uh on the one of the first ecstasies i bought an h3000 uh i bought a jose arandondo marshall um you know, it, it was. I just kind of went nuts. Um, as you would, as you would, as as you would. That, and then, then we found ourselves. So that's where I met Joey Brasler as well. And then, so Joey played guitar in in Steve Lukather's band for a little while. So then I find myself in Europe. We're playing with Toto, and I meet Steve, and Steve goes, Jack Jones. And then we have this rave, and as he leaves, he goes. You know, you're everything that Joey said you were. And I just was like, like, this is living your dreams. Like, this Fuck is, yeah. I mean, now, now whether he, whether he remembers that or not, or whether he, you know, I've seen Steve Luke a bunch of times since then, but you know, he meets, he meets so many people and, you know, I don't even know if he would, if he'd remember me, maybe, maybe he does. But, um, but that, that changed my world. Just like when, when Mike, said, hey, nice lick, man, when I was 15. It changed my life. Like, you know, meeting Jeff Beccaro, he played on Sleepwalk and every other fucking record known to man. Like, yeah. but, you know, like, like these were the cats that I grew up idolizing. Like, I just wanted to be like these guys. And all of a sudden, 21 and we're all, we're all kind of hanging out together. And it was, that was a pretty magical Magical time. And that was all through that, that Farnham connection. You know, yeah. if I hadn't been playing with John, that never would have happened. And, uh, and, you know, I love that guy. I did a whole tour. This, we did this whole run of shows. I didn't get to see him once. <laughs> oh, really? What a I shame. I was like so looking forward to catching up with him and I didn't even get to see him. But, um, uh, you know, that's life, isn't it? Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> man. So <clears throat> we talked a little bit earlier about the second album, uh, and you had Louis producing, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that was just great that you, yeah. you phoned in while he's at my place. That, that's awesome. Um, Dude. <laughs> now, what did, what did Louis bring to the party in terms of producer? Oh, everything. Like, well, there's just a level of there's a level of musicality that that guy has, and a and a uh, an experience that. You know, when you played on all those records and worked with the cat that guy's worked with, you know, that's another level. You, you, 
it doesn't matter how good you are. Like, it doesn't matter how much playing you've done. That guy, he brings generations of experience um, and, a, and a level. His ear is so tuned to, uh, finely tuned to, to pitch and harmony and, uh, and performance. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he just is... Uh, am I? Can you still see me? Uh, it just, just, me yeah, it just sort of froze a little. I got a frozen picture. I can still oh, hear God. you. Is that was some was uh, that someone trying to call you? It, I'm not. Okay, I'm not. Are you back? Touch you're back. You're back. You're back. I was worried about this. Yeah, no, you cool, man. Okay. Yep. So, so he he has this um, he has this beautiful um, and he has this beautiful way about him. He can ask you to do things and. And he can draw things out of you that you just didn't think were possible. And and we had a whole I had to I got to have the experience of making a whole record that was it was and he was so fucking patient. Because there were things that took you know, as a singer, look my guitar parts on those records happened very quickly. There were a lot of those things were, were very um, spontaneous and songs like Can't Breathe where Virgin and I play this little this kind of like I don't know, little outro kind of solo thing together. That all happened at the same time. Like that happened when Verge was putting his drums down. And we have these little interactive moments where we're actually in each other's heads. Yeah, you know, feeding off each other. Playing together. Mm -hmm. Feeding off each other. And like I think that was because we'd spent so much time, um, you know, just in that, in, that, um, in, in that environment, you know, doing that, doing that trade-off thing yeah. and i and i gotta say i attribute a huge amount of my guitar playing to virgil uh because there's a rhythmic rhythmical style to my playing that um that really uh you know i, I have i owe it all to Virgil. you know like all that kind of phrasing stuff that comes out of me just naturally yep um, you know, that all came from, from my time with Verge. Um, awesome. you know, it, it, yeah, that's, he, he really, he made a, an enormous contribution to me and Louis was, was there for all of that, that stuff. And I, I you know, I, I have very vivid memories of that, of that time. Cause you know, some of those songs are a pretty big thing as well. And, uh, you know, so there was, there were, strangely enough, the really challenging parts, the belting parts of, of that record yeah. um, didn't take as long as some of the things like Wildest Love, you know, um, took. You know, I remember that song taking because I had to, there's like a little scale in it. And, you know, for some reason at the time that took me a long, a long time to get those things. But the yep. guitar playing side of that, I mean, it's pretty fucking intimidating too. You're sitting in a room with Louis Shelton, motherfuckers. Like, holy crap! Like this, he's the man. Yep. And he's like, "Hey, do a." I'll never forget at the end of Shelter. Yep. There's this bit where I hit pick harmonic. It's like, Woo! and um, Louis was like, "Hey, let's uh, let's maybe we, maybe we'll try another. Let's try something else there, you know." And I was like, "Louis, oh, no, no!" no! <laughs> and I, I remember him turning around and going, "Yeah, let's leave the wild bit in." <laughs> yeah, classic. Classic. You say about he playing he in gave, front of him, man. You, know, you, yeah. you say about playing in front of yeah. him. I um, I went and picked this up the other day. Hey, Satch! Yeah. Fuck look yeah. At you. So, yeah. if anybody wants That's to buy a, one of these, this this belongs to a friend of mine. That's a it's a, a genuine Chrome boy. Um. And it's actually for sale. Um, and before it, it gets sold, yep. um, I thought I'd bring it home and record a little cover of uh, "Always with Me, Always with You." And um, oh, lovely! So I was telling I was telling Louis I was at his place a couple of nights ago, and I was telling him I was off to pick this up, and I picked up one of his guitars and played the song, and it was halfway into it oh. that it sort of struck me. It was like, dude, 
you're playing in front of Louie. <laughs> I normally don't pick up a guitar and play him. I was playing it. And he's look, looking at me. I'm uh-huh. doing all, all the tapping bit. And he goes, hey, I like that, Joe. Yeah. And yeah, you forget. <laughs> he's such a lovely chap. Now, if people don't know who we're talking about, because I'm going to admit, I'd grown up listening to Louie play on all the hits that my parents had uh, on the records as a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't know who he is, I've actually got a couple of really cool interviews on my channel. The first interview I ever tried to do was with Louis sitting here, and I pulled out a, a 1952 telly, a, a genuine one. Um, and we had a, a really nice interview just talking about that. So you have to excuse my really bad interviewing at the time. It was the first attempt. And we did one of these, one of the, the live ones, only a week or two ago. So please Google him, look up who he is, watch some of these because, man, underrated talent, very underrated and I'm going to put this down before Ferocious. I yeah I'm going to put this down before I uh, I scratch it or anything like that because look at it look at it oh, that's lovely isn't it ah uh, that's an era that's a real era that guitar isn't it totally mm, very nice mate very nice oh, there I am so Erwin <laughs> you had the success you played with Farnham you did the second album but as is usually the story man Second albums just sort of don't do what the first one did. And then record companies just, they're fucked. They don't, they want a hit <laughs> or, or see ya. Started. And so yeah, yeah. there was a third album, wasn't there, with Southern Sons? There was. Um, I didn't know that. I was. didn't know that. That's how fucking shithouse record companies are and not promoting um, that. Yeah, look, we just felt, we, we fell between the cracks. I mean, the second record... Uh, you know, uh, how do, how do you, um, look, like for most, most artists, if you have a successful first record, there's this second album syndrome where yeah. you, where, you know, you've got to kind of, it's, you're not, you're not new. You're not a new artist. You're not fresh in the sense that, you know, people have, people are familiar with you. And, you know, we had a lot of, the second record had a lot of, uh, like turntable success, but it didn't, it didn't sell the kind of units that the first record sold. And then our third record, uh, you know, someone once told me like record companies are designed to fail like artists. That's how they're designed. The, 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 the way they're, the, the way that the machine, the machinery is just, it's really clunky. And, at the best of times, it's a miracle to have a hit. That's why I feel so lucky that we had as many as, as we did. Because it, despite, despite the, uh, the design and the model, um, it, it's, uh, and, and you know what? There's a real irony to, to that whole game because, you know, you sign all this stuff away and I don't want to be one of these guys that bitches about like, you know, because for the most part, I've got, had pretty good relationships with record companies. However, you'd, you'd think they were good relationships because they got, you know, they definitely got their pound of flesh out of us as well. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a bit of give and take. But in the end, the crazy thing about a record deal is you're the only one that has to deliver what you said you deliver. Uh-huh. You're the only one. Because you have to deliver a record and you have to deliver a record that they like, that they agree to put out. Because they can turn around and say, well, you know what? We don't fucking like it. Make mm-hmm. another one. And yep. believe me, that happens all the time still. Mm-hmm. Make your record again. It fucking happens. Like it's, it's brutal. It can, it can be brutal. However, you can go and do that and they can make you all the promises in the world. But they don't have to deliver anything. They don't. They, in the end, they go, oh, we put it out and, you know, people didn't respond or we couldn't get this or we couldn't get that or so-and-so didn't, you know, whatever. And I've got plenty of stories of, of uh, and, you know, they're really not worth telling some of them. But, you know, how, how uh, and, and, you know, people can be, people in the business can be pretty brutal too. Um, as proud as I am of, of all of my work, when I released my first solo record, The Evolution of Erwin Thomas, there was, 
uh, you know, a big part of that campaign, um, you know, I said to the record company, don't tell people this is Jack Jones. Sure. Like, give it an opportunity to have a life. Yep. And they were all like, oh, no, 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 it doesn't matter. People are going to love that. You know what? When they went to Triple J, I said, for God's sake, don't tell Triple J it's me. Like, don't do that. Yep. Like, don't do that. Because, um, you know, let them find out. But don't, don't, don't give that up. And you know what? Here's what happened. They went to Triple J. And I won't say who went and I won't say who the, the people were because – but this is, this is what happened. Our head of marketing took the first single to uh, – let's just say to Triple J at the time, yep. a certain person, and said, we have this new artist, Irwin Thomas. What do you think? You know, blah, blah, blah. That person was listening to it and said, I love this record. We're 100% behind it. Tell me more about this artist. Like, I want to know what's – Tell me. And then the, uh, the marketing person goes, it's Jack Jones. He turns it off. Oh. Pulls it out of the CD, puts it back in the case and gives it back to him and says, we have played Jack Jones. Now, you know, that was, that was a pretty tough pill to swallow for me because, uh, you know, so that completely transformed how that person listened to that record. Yeah. And it wasn't fair. Life isn't fair. That's okay. Like, we all understand. But you know what? They fucking threw me under the bus, and I didn't like that. I didn't like the fact that we had it. We had the opportunity. And that, for that record, for that record, that was pretty much our, that was the gateway to the people that, um, that I thought we really needed to, to, to give us the support that, that that album needed, the touring support, the, the, the live show support, uh, that groundswell was going to come from. And, you know, that's a fucking powerful, that's a powerful station. Mm. At the time, they had like 2 million listeners, one station, 2 million, like, bang. That was very important. That was a crucial piece of our puzzle. And, and I think when that happened, I kind of, I sort of recoiled and went, fuck, wow. That's pretty, that's a... Um, I didn't realize that I that I was carrying this thing around because uh, you know for the most part I'm I'm pretty proud of a lot of my work and Absolutely. I don't think there's much stuff out there that I kind of listen to and go Ugh. I mean you know I think as an artist we all have that sort of stuff that we think oh if I did that I'd do it a bit better or I'd do it a bit different but for the most part um, so look when we made our third record uh, we had a lot of personal changes in the record company people didn't really get the band anymore. Grunge had really hit hard. And, and, you know, it was the end of an era. And we just got, we just went down the drain with a whole bunch of other bands that, uh, that you know, suffered the same fate. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of personnel changes in record companies at that time. You had a lot of bean counters coming in. And he, look, here's, here's a great way to, 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 to save a record company money. You know, I'm the new CFO of, you know, Bitch Slap Records. And, you know, I come in and the, the company's got to save some money. What are we going to do? Well, how many records have you committed to make this year? Ten. All right. What's the budget for each one of those records? hundred grand. I'll tell you what. Let's just drop all of those artists. I've just saved you a million dollars. I'm a fucking legend. Like, you haven't really contributed anything to the music business, which is kind of what you're supposed to be doing. Uh -huh. You're a record company. Yep. However, there was a changing of the guard and, and a lot of the music people started getting weeded out because, you know, it was a different model. It was, it was a whole different kind of um, – it was a different structure. And a lot of the music people and champions – that we had kind of weren't there anymore. So it, it was inevitable that that was going to unfold that way, yeah. um, you know, during that time. And, you know, when I signed my deal for the evolution, that was with, um, that was with Gotham. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was with Ross, Ross Fraser and jo John's label. Yep. And, uh, and I really felt like, you know, I really felt like BMG had let them down 
when they um, because because you know, I was pretty adamant to not mention the Jack Jones life, yep. only because I didn't want, you know, there's a preconceived idea of who that guy is. Yeah, you know, it's it's very weird for me to talk about myself in like a third person like that. It's I'm just the same guy. Like it doesn't matter. The reason I went back to my original, my real name was wasn't because. I was ashamed or had any issues with my past. I just wanted this musical offering to get a fair shot. And I thought that the way that we could create that was, was to be, was to call it something else. And you know what? I still stand by that. Yep. I'll still make Irwin Thomas records and I'll probably make a Jack Jones record. Yep. Like, because it gives me the freedom to, to, to do a certain style of music and, and do another certain style of music. The thing about my life as Erwin Thomas is I get to do whatever the fuck I want as that guy, and no one can tell me what to do. No one can tell me how to make a record. Ironically, I feel the same way about a Jack Jones record, but I think stylistically there is a certain uh, responsibility that I have to people that have supported me doing a certain thing, and I feel uh, – and I love that music anyway. I fucking love the 80s and the 90s. Like, I do. Uh, yeah. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? It was a fucking do, good era. It was right? a good era, man. Yeah. So I got no drama making a record that that pays homage to, to, to that era. Yep. It's probably, in a lot of ways, what comes naturally to me, too. Yep. You know? Yep. So, yep. so you know, the, like, mate, the journey continues. And, and look, I, I, to be honest with you, and, you know, look, Rick, Rick Price and I, we made a record – for a major for Sony, like, and for the most part, that was a very enjoyable experience. I loved going to Nashville. I loved working with Fred Eltringham, Fred Eltringham, Steve Mackey, Dan, uh, um, Dan Dugmore. Like, we had some great people on that record. Vance Powell mixed it. Like, ah! you know, like uh, living the dream. Totally living the dream. Like, totally. like so. So look, they have a they have a place, but um. And, and, you know, I still have quite, you know, I have good relationships with a lot of those people still. Um, they've remained intact. A couple of them I want to punch in the face. But, you know, I'm sure there's a few people out there that probably want to do the same to me as well. So, cheers to that. <laughs> well, Erwin, leading on, look, after the third record, you, you moved to LA. You were working for Bogner. Okay, so in 2009... I was in New York with uh, Electric Mary. We were doing some shows. Yeah. Um, and I had a bit of an epiphany. I was like, I really feel like I need to, to be here. Yep. Um, and a whole, set of, uh, a whole set of circumstances unfolded, and I ended up moving to New York. And during that time, I reconnected with, um, with, uh, with Reinhold and, and a bunch of guys from LA and, and the position came up for the director of us sales. And, and I, uh, and I went in like fully committed, uh, which is weird because, I mean, it's not weird when I do something, when I, and they're my mates, yep. they're my mates. And, and I, I fucking love them. And I was, you know, I was very, very, very committed to that, to that, that job. Um, and I'd never really had a job like that before. Um, and I think I think I kind of was just craving. Um, I was really inspired with the idea of doing something new. And I felt like I could really, uh, it's, it's not hard selling something that you really believe in and love. And that, uh, you know, I've played Reinhold Dance, Reinhold Dance for a long time. And I've always had a great relationship with him and Jorg and, and that company, so it took a, it took a bit to get that over the line, but but uh, I, I I ended up taking that position and moving to LA, and um, and we started we embarked on that um, on that on that uh, that road that experience, and it was pretty it was pretty intense. Um, it was a very eye opening experience, and look, it was tough. It was really tough. The guy that did that, uh, 
that did was it was in that position before me is a beautiful guy uh and fred is beloved in the industry like you know he has very very long standing relationships and i think people um were were disappointed and hurt when he was relieved of his position and and i think i inherited a bit of that um and there was a lot of people that didn't even want to talk to me about that uh about those about you know about buying in any Bogner stuff. Um, however, we made some we made some great videos for those pedals, and um, and and I think we did some great work. But it was a very challenging time, and it and uh, it came to a, to an end pretty. Look, I thought prematurely, but in the end, um, like these things happen, and and look, that was that was that ended up being. A, a very difficult time for me in LA um, in the end, because, you know, I'd, I'd pretty much decided and had, and had been uh, pre warned that, you know, I wasn't going to be able to do, I wasn't be able to play for like two years. Wow. Cause that job was going to require a, a lot of, uh, a lot of focus on things that weren't, you know, however, I thought, that me playing was the best way to sell any of that stuff. Totally. Like that to me, that to me was the, was the, was what would get it over the line. And those pedal videos were very successful for us at the time, you know, and I think they've worked, I think they've worked really well. I still love those guys, you know, I miss them and I love them. And yeah, I'll always be a champion for, for that, for that, you know, for Ryan Holden, the boys, because, you know, um, I love those guys. Well, I, I do know the um, the videos that you're talking about, um, but I didn't realise that you were working for them at the time. I thought you were just, hey, let's get this hotshot guy to come and play yeah. some demos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, you also well, met I Dave Friedman was, around the same like, time, didn't you? I met Dave in 1990? Really? 91, maybe? Okay, yeah. I mean, and he, that guy, oh, look, I don't even know where to start with Dave because um, I don't even know where to start with that guy. When, because I mean, I, I'm going to text him right I, now, man. <laughs> Get him to come on if he's oh, not Oh, please do. Yeah, yeah. Please do. I am. I, I, I'm just trying to, to remember how how that all sort of unfolded when we first met. I, it was when I went to, he was working for making music. I don't know if it was making music or if it was a long Cohen studio rentals, which was previously Andy Brower. Um, so they used to do cartage for all the session caps, you know, like Landau, Dan Huff, Dean Parks, like Luke. I probably did stuff with Jay Grade and Buzzy Feet and like all those, all those guys. Um, yeah, they'd take their rigs to sessions and have them set up and then collect them and take them to the next session. And they'd, you know, that was, or well, they'd hire out, you know, vintage gear to, you know, cats. Um, uh, just, yeah, I mean, that, that, they were a massive institution in the, in the 80s and the 90s, you know. And I remember meeting Dave. He was a young guy and he, he was the guy that was responsible for turning me on to Eggnator. The Bruce, cool, and um, also THD. Yeah, uh, he was like, check this Plexi Plexi fifty out, and I was like, holy shit, that's a you know. Um, now during that time, I met guys like Tim Pierce, and but Dave was Dave was he, he you know what he was one of those cats that well not was but at the time he was he still is but he was one of those guys that would say uh, like you know because I was I was. I was putting together these rigs, like these massive racks, all this gear in it. I was a massive fan of Bradshaw and, you know, I was intrigued and fascinated by how these guys put their rigs together. And, and I really wanted to know everything that I could know about it. Um, but, you know, at the time, people weren't very forthcoming with telling you anything. Because, you know, they were pretty secretive and protective about Sure. I remember calling Bob Bradshaw after I'd met him heaps of times and said, mate, you know, what order does so-and-so 
put their things in their rig and he's like, hey, man, come on. You know, I can't tell you that. Like, really? And it, I totally get it. I totally get it. Like, you know, now it's different because people go to gigs, take photos of everyone's rigs, and you can reverse engineer how most guys' rigs are put together. Like, it's not, it's not such a big deal. No one really cares anymore. But during that time, they were very, very closed off about the information that would get shared. But you know what Dave would do? What's that, mate? He'd say to me, he'd, I'd call him up and he'd say, hey, man, you know, why don't you try, why don't you just try this? And I'd go, oh, okay, you know. I mean, I, in that early, those early days, Dave and I hung out quite a bit. We were listening to a lot of music and playing and, and I just had a, um, well, just maybe 10 years ago, he, um, God, maybe, tw- maybe eight years ago, he modified a Marshall for me. Uh, uh, a, J, a JDM 45 100 reissue. They only made a few of those amps, and and he did a um, he did a great mod, and and I'll never forget being in, like at at a in his in his workshop, like pulling out resistors and capacitors, capacitors while I'm playing, going, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? It you know it it really uh, reignited my my love for um, for that tone uh, that tone pursuit yeah you know that that pursuit of like this ultimate guitar sound that we're all all us guitar players geek out on all the time and um, you know he's just a real special cat to me when I finished up with Bogner he was like yeah I don't know why you were doing that man he goes because I went over to his place I have a big rack of his I was asking him how to do some stuff with it. And um, he goes, why don't you come in and have a play through, through some of the amps? And I was like, oh, of course. So I sat and played through his the B100 for about an hour. And he was like, man, you know, you should be pedaling amps, man. You should be playing guitar. Like, that's what you should be doing. Another, another thing that really moved me emotionally, you know, I just was like, because, you know, this guy builds amps for Steve Stevens. And, like, <laughs> you know, this... Why would he give a shit about me? Like, why would he? And and what blew me away was that he remembered, like, he remembered us hanging out in the early days together. And I know he didn't talk about it that much when he was when he was on with you, but I I was blown away that he uh, that he even remembered that, and uh, and I was quite moved. And again, you know, this this shit it makes you humble, man. Yeah, it really does. It, it really, it really, um, uh, you know, as much as you make your own luck and all that sort of, you know, all that stuff, it still does blow me away when I think, wow, those those guys remembered that stuff. I'll, I'll never forget. Um, oh God, talk about regrets that you have in life. Yeah, <laughs> like musical yeah. regrets. Yeah. So Joey, so Joey used to have this band, this little 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 sort of jazz uh, jazz jam band. And um, there's two gigs that I remember they used to do in L.A. One was in Reseda at this, like, fucking Mexican cantina joint. And, um, and I, I remember uh, I was hanging out with Steve Farris quite a, Mr. a bit Mr. during that time, yep. who, oh, who, who was a massive influence. One of, one of, I think, the most underrated or under-acknowledged guitar players of, I mean, that guy. And a lovely cat, you know, great guy. Um, I remember we were hanging out one night. We went down to this Mexican cantina. This isn't actually the regret, but I'll just, I'll, yep. I'll, 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 he- I'll, I'll head there through this little yep. windy road. And Mike Landau was sitting in with, with Joey's band that night. He had a deluxe, a tube screamer in his strap. That was it. I saw him do another gig. Uh, when he had like his little burning water, like rack and, and rig and stuff. But this night he was just using that. And Mike played a version of Red House that just basically made us all want to fucking blow our brains out and burn all our shit. Like I remember looking at Steve and Steve looking at me going, I was like, what the fuck? Like, really? Is that even possible that that guy could just unleash that with, with such so little... You know, like he was just fucking all over it, you know. And um, and during that time, we crossed paths 
a, a lot, you know, through that sort of, through that little network of, of people. But I remember sitting in with Joey's band. I sat in with Joey's band that night reluctantly because I was like, who wants to get up and play? So I was so young and stupid and naive. Like, I didn't have any of those hang-ups. I was like, yeah, I'll get up and have a play. Yep. Like, it was only later that I thought, what was the fucking point of that? Like, um, but, but that, you know, th- uh, there was another one of those. <laughs> and they, they used to do this other gig. Uh, in the, it was at the back of this bowling alley. Like, it was weird. In Bobby LA. Kimball came down that night. In LA. Is this Bobby um, Lucky Strike? That night. Is that the venue? What was that? Lucky Strike. Is that the venue you're talking about? Oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I can't remember the gig. That's, that's, that's in a bowling alley. I was there recently. Oh, it's a couple a, of years ago, actually. Okay, yeah. I, yeah. I do know that venue. It, it, this was like in probably 1991, 92. Okay, okay. And, um, and I, I mean, that was the night I met Bobby Kimball, and I was like, oh, my God, like, this is one of my heroes. And I sat in with Joey's band that night and played a couple of songs. I think we did Foxy Lady and a couple of other Hendrixy sort of tunes. And Joey introduces me to this guy, Howard Alexander Dumble. <laughs> and I'm going to cr- I am going to cry now cuz ah, he goes he goes yeah, he goes, "Hey man, I really love you playing." He goes, "I'd love to build some amps for you one day." And I I got small, like I and I never took him up. And he was like, "Get my number from Joey, like, you know, you give me a call and you come out and see me and I'll build you some, I'd love to build you some ads. Like, and I don't worry. I knew who he was. Like, uh, you know, the, the voice of his aunt in the hands of, you know, the Dave Lindley's, the Larry Carlton's, the Rab- Robin Ford's, the, you know, there, there's, the, there's a lot of cats, a lot of, you know, a, a, you know, a, a lot, of, lot of great, great guitar players, you know, uh, and that and that sound was a huge part of my DNA um, growing up. Um, and one of my greatest regrets is that I never, I never, and not because his amps are, you know, worth two hundred thousand dollars now. Got nothing to do with that. It's just that would have been such a great experience. You know what? Fuck it. I hope I get to have that experience still one of these days. You never know. It's highly unlikely, but. You know, I'll never forget that that night because I just I got small, I think, and I just wow. was like, "Why would he want to build an amp for me? Like, why would he want to do that?" Like, and I I just think I didn't believe it. Yeah, right. I, I, so I never I never followed it through because I think I was afraid of some kind of rejection or something. Yeah, yeah. Which was just ridiculous. Like I should have just done it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, that's my that's my little Alexander Dumble story that came from that era of of Dave Friedman, and you know Dave. Dave has always been, he's another guy that's just been so consistent with me over the years. He's just a beautiful guy. And, you know, I'm so, I'm so happy to see him doing, and I don't want this in any way to sound disingenuous or condescending or patronizing or anything, but I know how hard that guy has worked in his career. Like, um, and the passion that he has for, for rigs and sound and tone and, and you know he's fucking nailing it. He's just absolutely. He has been for a, a long, a long time. But now the world is, now the world knows who he yeah. is. And I just, I just love. It makes me just so happy for him. You know, it's, yep. he's, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Awesome man. Real awesome. great guy. Yeah. A no, believer. Been... And, and you know, Reinhold, Reinhold, oh. same. You know, Reinhold, same. Although Reinhold's been on the map, you know, a, you know, a bit older, a bit longer. Um, but the same, you know, I, I fucking love that guy. <laughs> yeah. Cool, man. Cool. Now, Owen, mm. um, we, <laughs> we, we haven't really talked much about gear, but it's been some great stories, man, some great insight into just, uh, what's been happening with you over the years and stuff. Oh. We haven't really gotten to the gear, yeah. and uh, I, I am going to get to the let's gear. Do let's, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So when I was first aware of you – no, not when I was first aware of you, when you sort of had the whole Southern Suns – John Farnham thing. You're playing Valley Arts guitars. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, that was because that was that was obviously because I was a huge Steve Lukather uh, fan, and um, and I can't remember the company. C M C maybe I can't remember who. 
Australians? I don't know who who was bringing them in at that time into Australia. Um, I but I I hunted I hunted them down because I wanted to have a play through. I wanted to play with one of these guitars. Yeah. And um and they were very good to me at the time. Um, and that Red Valley Arts was a was a um I I got a lot of that was my EMG uh, phase. You know, EMG, Sultano X88R, sort of, you know, uh, uh, era, <laughs> you know, and um, that was that was be- that was before I discovered that you could solo on your front pickup with distortion. You know, like that was that was before I I really started <clears throat> discovering how. Yeah, that was that was just pre. Look, when I was when I was growing up, and I loved those cats, the Landau's, the Dan Huffs, the Dean Parks, the Larrys, the Luke, the you know, like all these the Jay Graydon's, Buzzies. Like I, I used to buy, I used to buy records because I used to buy Amy Grant records because Mike Landau was on two songs. Wow, yeah, yeah. Like just so I could hear what he was. I modeled my like studio chops. On all of those guys, because that was what I wanted to do. That's that's what I wanted to be the cat that played on people's hit records. Yep. Um, and uh, and I wanted to be that that A list guy that people called to you know to play on their records. And um and uh, so you know I, I I that Valley Arts kind of to me it represented. I never forget that Hotlicks video, that Luke Hotlicks video. Um. It just that changed. Now that one and the Larry Carlton one changed my life. Yeah. I remember at fourteen listening to that, watching that video, and at the end of it, Larry Carlton says, "You know, and I wish you good luck." And I used to bore my eyes out as a fourteen-year-old kid. I used to think, "Yes, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like that guy." Yeah. Um, and I used to think he was talking to me. Like I didn't think it, but I used to really feel like it. He looks right down the barrel of the camera and he goes, "Not wish you." Good luck. And then they cut to him playing at the baked potato. And and you know what? 30 years later, I was standing right where he stood at the baked potato playing with Virgil. That's awesome. Oh, That's awesome. It's, yeah. And, and I know for anyone who's been to the baked potato, probably doesn't think that it's like it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not the Hollywood bowl. But I'll tell you what, it's the baked potato. And it's the place that I grew up. Like that place and love a Lee and you know to to have the opportunity to go and play there um, was just just uh, it was just beautiful just beautiful you know I loved it. and and the Valley Arts was sort of a you know I guess it was what I was uh, that was that, that kind of greasy guitar sound with all this ju- juice on it and um and that that was uh that was really um that was a just a huge. That was a that that guitar was a big part of that time in my life. Yeah, you know. Yep. So I've always known you as the super strat kind of guy because there was the Valley Arts. You also had a Charvel, humbucker two singles. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then even now you're playing Charles Cilia guitars, which I really want to get my hands I, on. Charles is lovely, and um, yeah, standout builder for me. Show show us show us. Yes. This is one of this is one of the hot sort of strats. It's got a standard tremolo. It's an older uh, ash body flame flame maple neck. Look at that flame, dude. I don't know if you can see that. Well, it's a little bit grey, but, but yeah, yeah, awesome. Is it? Shame. It's a, g- a gorgeous guitar. It's got his pickups in it. Yeah. Um so there's so we have we have a signature series guitar uh, coming out. Oh, we did one that was like a Les Paul, Les Paul sort of style guitar, yep. but um, but uh, we have another one coming out, and it's there's two versions of it. I'm yelling because I'm. It's like I shouldn't be yelling because I'm just talking to you here. That's okay, um, man. So there's that there's that guitar which is like the more sort of standard kind of strat. I mean, you know, slightly hot strat, like yep. a humbucker in the bridge, a bit more, um, you know, push push on the um on the second tone, mm-hmm. the split, split the back pickup. This is, 
I haven't had a, 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 a Floyd Rose guitar for a long time, and I I asked Charles to build a a um a guitar for me. It has a very it's a very V neck. I cool. love this neck on this guitar. Yeah, yeah. Um, got the Floyd. It's got his pickups in it. Is the Floyd um, floating or is it um is it flush mounted? It's floating and it's it's well it's flush. I don't know if you can if you can see it. It's oh you probably can't see it from that angle. Hang on. Other side. It's flush. Can you get that? Oh yeah yeah okay. So it doesn't pull back. Yeah. It's, so it's, it does. It it's, does. It's 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 recessed into the body. Into the body. Okay. Yeah yeah cool. So man, you can pull back. You can you know go yeah, all the way down. That's pretty much what I'm I'm I chasing right now, man. It's something exactly like that. I'm gonna get get onto Charles to build me you one of those. Give him a call. I, you should. It's yeah. a beautiful guitar. I talked to I him recently. Love this guitar. And I'm just going to say, dude, build me one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should just get get one before they come out. He'll, I'm sure he'll. That's now. That's older. That's older. Yep. And and that that's the prototype of that guitar. So once we once we do the, you know, the um, the sort of full production model of that guitar, that will have a flame maple neck. Um, I'm pretty keen to do the compound radius board yeah. for playability. Yeah. I'm a bit like Doug these days. I don't really want to work as hard. Like I used to, used to have 11s and 12s on my guitars and um, I, had a, I had a phase where I really, you know, and it took, I remember, I remember the day that I picked up my guitar with 11s. I felt like I could play it. Like it took months of, it was like going to the gym. Yeah. You know, I had to work up to play this guitar and I used to, for some reason, I think I just, it was my Stevie Ray Vaughan phase and I thought, you've got to, you've got to work hard. You've got to work hard to get it. And now, these days, I don't want to work hard. I want it no, to be no. easier and enjoyable. I couldn't believe Doug said that he's using noise. I was like, what? Yep. Sounds like he's using fucking fence wire. The guy's well, sound is I think that's a big misconception, Massive. man. That's a big misconception, huh? Because I, is. it is. It, Rick Beato brought it to light to everybody recently in in a video. If anyone's ever seen that, but I had to drop Great. drop a gauge Love or two um, in recent years just through tendonitis and stuff. And I call bullshit, man. Like everyone's going, "Oh no, your tone, oh you cut." A friend gave me a set of eights, and it didn't sound pissy. It sounded just oh. like me. It sounded like me, but it was easier to play, and. Pretty much anything yeah, I could think yeah, yeah. of playing, I could pull it off because I didn't have that fight. And I don't know why I didn't, didn't go down that road earlier. So now I'm only limited by my knowledge and, and not – can the fingers do, do ah. this? Yeah, it can. I just need some new ideas, you know. <laughs> I'm limited by my yeah, ideas, right. well, that's not a, finger strength. What a, what, a great place to, what a great place to arrive at. Mm. Like um, I remember playing a mate of mine's guitar that had nines on it. And I just, because I've got a fairly, I've developed a kind of heavy right hand. Yep. And I just, it was really low action, kind of like how my Valley Arts and Charvel used to be set up. Yeah. Like those, they were, they were, they were all nines. They were all nine to 42s, like yep. all those guitars. And, um, uh, and they were buttery, buttery to play, like, you know, you just your hand just slid all over the all over the neck. It was just like, I mean, you just think of the note and put your finger kind of near where it was, and it came out. Yeah. Like, and, and my right hand was very delicate. Those in those days, as I got into the more blues style guitar players, my right hand got heavier. Um, and I used to I would attack the guitar in a different, you know, um, a different way. Uh, but I'm on tens now. I'm on ten to forty sixes, and in E and E flat. Okay. And when in in E flat, they kind of feel like nines. Yeah, yeah. So they, I did the whole tens they, but, but, down but, a half step for oh years, and yeah, I'm with you on that. That it feels like mm -hmm. that. But when you think about it, Eddie Van Halen used nine to forty <laughs> yeah. down a half step, which would feel like eights. Oh my God! Totally, totally. And that's a huge part of, you know what? That's a um, that's a very interesting thing that you, that, a very interesting point that you make there. I mean, that guy's, uh, you know, I mean, he's 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 the man. He he's the God. benchmark. He's, he's the, the benchmark. God status. Yep. yep. He's, yeah. 
Now, yeah, what gets me yeah, about his really, tone? Because um... it's it's totally in the fingers, right? You look you listen to the album Fifty One Fifty, and a lot of those tracks, he's playing a fucking plastic guitar man, a Steinberger. It's carbon fiber, whatever, <laughs> right? And Get up. Uh, yeah, um, you seem to have frozen on me again. Has somebody tried to call you? Someone's trying to uh, call me. Don't there you worry are. About there it. there you are. Yeah, you're back. You're, you're cool, man. You're cool. Hey! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you listen to those tracks. You listen to those tracks, and it's not like, oh shit, his tone changed. Fuck no, it's in his hands, man. You know what, guys used to. I, when I was on my my hunt, I used to think that there was all these secrets, and there's a few. There's a few little secrets that a lot of those guitar players had. Yep. Now I wouldn't say that they're massive conspiracies. Yep. But they were little things that these guys had that no one was going to tell you about. Sure. You know. Um, well, not no one, but it was very hard to extract that information without, you know, imp- applying some kind of serious fucking Jedi mind shit. Yeah, Try yeah. and get someone to give it any of that up, you know? And rightly so. Like, I, I totally get it. But people would tell me for years, you know, it's in the hands, man. It's in the fingers. Just yeah. like, get that, get that shit down. And you listen to guys like, God rest his soul, Chet. And, um, you know, Stuart Fraser, like, these these guys, he could play, he played through a Smokey. I remember when he played through Sun, is it Sun? Sun Amps? When Fender started making Sun, I think they, I remember seeing him do a, a gig with Noise Works, and it was the best guitar sound I'd ever heard him have. Yeah. It, it was, it, it was fucking mental yeah. how good it was. Like, yeah. It jumped out of the PA like it hit you in the face like a fucking sledgehammer. It was just like, poof. It was massive. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting example because he used to use very heavy string, you know? Yeah. But, but traditionally, that guy could play through anything and sound like him. He pretty much dialed his sound out of anything. And that was when I discovered... I like had the epiphany that I never used to believe it when people used to tell me that about Mike, about Landau. This is 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. I didn't believe it. Like people would say, mate, uh, but I had that experience with Mike at a barbecue one day where we got up, we played together and um, he was playing a 335 through my mate, through my mate Joey Brazler's Marshall 50 watt um, D.D. Fryette modded that amp, I think. Anyway, he was playing a 335 through this Marshall, through a 212, and it sounded like he was playing a Strat into a Super Reverb or a Deluxe. Yeah. It was, it was just like, and that was when I just went, like my third eye just like opened up. And um, <laughs> that was... That was a fucking crazy barbecue. Um, <laughs> that, that, that was a crazy barbecue. There was a moment when Mike and I were playing together and we were just all jamming. There was a, there was a drummer and a, I, don't, I don't remember who was playing bass. We were all ripped out of our minds. But, um, but I remember Mike looking over at me and he was going, and I was just in his head, like, because I'd been, I'd immersed myself in his guitar playing. Yeah. When I discovered Burning Water, and yeah. like he fucking ruined me. He <laughs> ruined me for about 15, 15 years, 20 years. He fucking did. When I got Tales from the Bulge, I ended up being on the cover of the Raging Honkies record. Really? Like if, if, you look up, if you look up We Are The Best Band, that's Jorg and I on the cover of that record. That was when I heard him play with Abe Jr. and his brother Teddy, and that, that transformed. I had, a, I had a religious experience that night. Like... And it was funny because Joey called up, called Mike, like when that record came out and he goes, man, you, you fucking, you don't understand the guy that's on the cover of that record. Like he's a famous guy in Australia. Like they're going to be all over you. You've got to you fucking, you don't, you can't have him on the cover. I'm holding a Corona and my mouth is like, what's the album, man? I got to write this down. I got to look it up. It, it's the Raging Honkies. We are the best band. Raging Honkies. Get that record. Okay. We are the best band. The I'm best gonna look band. That up. And, yeah. and, for a, and for a little time there, they fucking were. <laughs> cool. Very cool. 
that was that was that was when I first saw Abe Junior play, and um, and he he fucking ruined me too. Like when I say ruined me, it was just like I couldn't I couldn't listen to anyone else play guitar for a long time. After I got Tales from the Bulge and 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 um, I think it was the first Burning Water record. I mean, when I discovered that band and, and Mike's playing in that genre, that style and his sound, his tone, it really it made it it made it very very difficult for me to listen to any other guitar player, like because it was just a fucking letdown, <laughs> like it really was. It it was it it really it fucking messed me up there for a while. Like I I, I say that I mean that in the best of. It's the it's the highest of compliments, yeah, you know. Yeah. Like, and and I just I, I fell in love with I just fell in love with um with how he approached that his instrument. And you know, it's funny when you listen to Tales from the Bulge, you hear a bit of Mike, uh, you hear a bit of um Van Halen in there, yeah. totally, and you hear Alan Holdsworth in there. Cool. You know, you hear a lot of Alan Holdsworth and his voice things, and and um and that song is like an audio file record. I don't know if you have that record. No, but. If if you don't, if you've got to get that record. Tales from the Tales Bulge. From the bulge. Okay, that's going down is. as well. Tales from the Mate, Bulge. That, that was Mike's solo offering. Anyway, look, I could talk about that guy for you know for I could do it. I could do two hours just talking about how because uh, you know he 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 just he just kind of came into my world and um and that was when I was playing with that was kind of during the time that I was with playing with Dweezil. And living up at the house, um, and uh, and that was probably that was probably some of the best guitar playing I've ever done in wow. my life. That was probably the best, uh, most on my game that I've ever been because uh, you know I was learning all these songs for Dweezil's band for Z Dweezil and Armit. I was making a little record with Armit at the time, and um, and Dweezil and I were hanging out and just just playing every day in in their studio and. And you know that's another great, like that family, the Zappa family, like man, they loved me at a time when I felt like I was, I was pretty unlovable. Really, I'd just gone through a, my marriage had fallen apart, and yeah. and I was on the phone to Dweezil, and, and he goes, "Hey man, I just fired my guitar player and my bass player. Why don't you come and join my band?" Cool. And I was like, "You know what? Let's do that." And I just jumped on a plane. They let me stay at the house. I stayed in the little bungalow. Out the back that, you know, Vinnie Colliuta and Warren Cookerulo and all these cats, you know, like lived in. <laughs> and uh, again, you know, you just pinch yourself and you go, did that actually happen? You know, and I felt, I, you know, like, Dweezil and I still message each other from time to time, you know. And, uh, you know, you just, you, it's it's not that it's Dweezil Zappa, it's just that it's that, it's that these people were so... Um, welcoming to me and so encouraging I, I remember we were playing in his studio one day so i'm just driving here you're right okay? man you, yeah no you go for it go for it i i, I don't I'm have to just, be anywhere okay okay so we're downstairs in this in the studio and he goes hey man he called me i was in in my room and he called me and uh he goes check this out i just i just found this marshall i just found this old marshall right so he had his, his um, Eddie Van Halen Ernie Ball and he was playing through it and you know he you know he can rip Eddie like yep as a matter of fact matter of fact there's been times where he's <laughs> he where he's taught Eddie Eddie's licks oh, is that right him. like yeah like like he was making this record I don't know if it ever got finished and I don't ever I don't know if I ever made the final cut. He, he was working on this record called What the Hell Was I Thinking? And Blue Sarantino and myself did little cameos on this, but there was people like, you know, there was Steve Vai, um, you know, uh, I mean, he had Brian May, uh, Angus and, and, um, and Malcolm, like wow. Michael Hedges. Like he had, he'd written all these little pieces of music for all these guitar players to come and jam over, and he was sticking them all together, and he was flying everywhere to record these guys, you know? He's, he's famous guitar player. Yep. And Blues and I got a little looking, I guess, because we were mates and, you know, we were, we were all hanging around at the same time. Um, and Eddie, he, he had Eddie come up to play on 
on some stuff. He had Malmsteen. Malmsteen played wow. on the blues, I think. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like of all the of all the things to get Ingo Malmsteen to play over, you know. Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. Absolutely hilarious. Yeah. But uh but when Ed when Ed came up to to, to do his, his little bit, Dweezel had had like connected a whole bunch of famous Eddie licks together mm-hmm. and he kind of retaught them back to Eddie to to you know for him to play on on um on his little uh, his little musical interlude his his piece wow it's pretty pretty crazy stuff man pretty crazy stuff totally totally yeah so that was a whole oh. era I, I i did recall that you um had played with dweezil man you must have played a lot of stuff i'm going to bring up a project mudhead i've oh, yeah, seen you in drag Gary. man i've yeah. seen you in drag uh hey, i've known, I've known I've known Dave Leslie for a long time, and he showed me a film clip oh, lovely, of bro. you, yeah. him, <laughs> Gary Beers from In Excess. I can't remember who was on drums, yeah. but you guys were all in this film clip in drag, uh, singing away. It was, it, might, it was either Alex Formosa or it was Peter Malzahn. I think it was Alex. I think Alex was – yeah, look, that was a great time. That was a great experience too, That that um, making that record with Gary. I mean, that opened up a whole he, – he'd just done – uh, Absent Friends, I think it was oh, yeah. called, with yeah. um, with with Wendy Matthews and, and Sean, Sean, um, Sean Kelly, yeah. Kelly, I, Kelly. Yeah. Um, I play I play guitar for Sean when he comes yeah, up this he, way in the absolutely eighties band. Oh, you do. He's a lovely guy, he's man. A, he's, he's a lovely, a lovely guy. Yeah. yeah. These guys, they're all they're all you know. But yeah, we 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 uh we did that record. We did a couple of videos, and uh, one of them, I think that was for Coitophobia. Lezo, Lezo is a beautiful guitar player, isn't it? Totally, I mean, man. Totally. Talk about, and and he's got such a unique style about his playing. It's just uh, he approaches the guitar of, uh, I mean, just listen to all that baby animal stuff. Mm. I mean, he's it's it's uh, it's very it's a it's a beautiful thing. He's got a real identity. Totally. And again, lovely chap. Uh, beautiful, absolutely man, beautiful he's been guy. so nice to me from. Quite a young age, actually, man. Um, just trying to think. Mm-hmm. How He's old a very would supportive. Be? Oh, supportive totally. Guitar player. Totally, man. Totally. Now, just in terms of Australian players, like there's yourself, my, my influences, the ones that big influences on me. Yourself, Dave Leslie, Mark Lazotte, Diesel, and um, Ian yeah. Moss. They'd, they'd be the, the guys that I'd cool. really sort of um, really put down as big influences on, on me. And. Um, yeah. Yeah. All lovely guys. Oh. And we, we were talking about the gear side of things. And I've seen you yeah, over the years. Yeah, yeah. Like so I said you're a super strat kind of guy. And I, I've seen you in Southern Suns. You mentioned you had the X eighty eight R Soldano preamp. I remember seeing you with a huge rack full of gear, man, with the H three thousands and all that. And you had this gorgeous green fender custom shop guitar, man. Yeah. Oh, that was a Beautiful looking guitar, that. That's regret number two. Yeah. I can see it in your and face, you know, man. Again, again, you know, and I know the guy who's got that guitar. I begged him to sell it back to me uh, for our last tour yep. because cause I was like, you know, um, because I thought this is the opportunity to play that guitar again, to just like, it, to relive that experience, uh, yep. you know. But, you know, I sold the guitar and it belongs to somebody else and that's life. It's a guitar. It's just a guitar. Well, but it was a part of my era. Like it was a, it was a part of a big it, – it, it was a part of a very big part of my life as a player. And, and I loved Margaret um, for, for making that happen at Fender and, and Glyn, Glyn and Harvey. Um, you know, those, those guys really – they they made that opportunity possible for me to get Jay Black to make those guitars for me, and I look. I regret the I regret the day that I ever got rid of those guitars. But again, you know, it's uh, people don't re- realize sometimes um, how tough it um you know just how tough it can be as at an times artist, absolutely for artists, absolutely. And, and you know, it's they're not my finest hours in life. They're not the finest decisions that I've ever made. I've got to live with them, and that's life, and that's what you do. What you got to do to survive at the time, and uh, and and they were they were choices that I made at the time. That that you know, if I could go back and undo them and make different decisions, um, 
then I then I'd do it. But um, but you know, that's sometimes they're they're the things that you just have to do to. Yeah, don't mind me, mate. I to, just uh, had to. Uh, I just had to re, re- no, put right. the, the battery in my my camera there. Um, now, yeah, I'll go to the shot of juice so people don't see me doing this. Uh, I know Dave Leslie that's had a similar right. thing where he sold his Pride and Joy, um, his old L series years ago, right? Uh huh. Do you know where I'm going with this? You, you know, go like, go there though. Okay. If you haven't told this story, you've got to tell it. Oh, Amen. Yeah. So oh, yeah, I, I know he had his. I'm taking a guess now. 63, 64. L series, the year of his birth, anyway, and I know that was his pride and joy. I've got videos of me hanging at his place in the early nineties and using that guitar. Have I got the right camera on here? Yes, I do. That's that one. And again, artists fall on hard times, and he sold it to a guy that lives locally here. And I don't think he wants to be named. Actually, <clears throat> he, there's been other other guitars. That he said, "I oh, don't name me," but he only a couple of years ago, gave it back to him. Not, this is yours, it's, I still own this, but this belongs with you. And handed it back to him, and he's still, still got it in his possession, which was just, yeah, you know, he sold it for a lot of money. Um, and yeah, I can remember mm. going to the sound check that, that they were playing at Twin Towns. I'm going to bring up Twin Towns. You sang their jingle years ago, didn't you? Do you remember that? I, you know what? I think they still play it. They do, they do, yeah. So anyway, I went to their I've sound check. What a, what a life. Yeah. I'm that guy, I'm that guy. Mate, I'm on the radio everywhere for old jingles I've done in the past too. But yeah, I went to this baby animal show at, uh, at Twin Towns and um, mm. I've seen his guitar on stage. I'm like, is that? And he's going, yes. And he's come over to me and he's just gone, man, you wouldn't believe it, but he gave it back to me last night. No way. And we were just blown out. What the generosity, that's just... Amazing. Isn't that incredible? Absolutely know, amazing. Right? Yeah, yeah. That story warmed it warmed me to the to my cockles. Yeah. It really did. Like it just yeah. made me so uh that's beautiful. And you know what? That that guitar does belong in that guy's hands. It does, it's, man. Uh, it does. It, yeah. And but but you know what? But but someone else bought that guitar and it you know, and uh but what a what a what a gesture. Like you can't, yeah, I think it's a phenomenal thing for someone to do. And, and, you know, uh, albeit that man, you know, remains, uh, remains nameless here. Good work. What an, what an awesome thing to do. Thumbs in the air. Totally. Beautiful. Totally. So I, I, I'm going off the subject of the gear, but back to when you were playing all these refrigerators were full of, of stuff. Um, when I saw you recently with Southern Suns doing your reunion tour up at Southport RSL there, yep. there was no backline. It was all Axe Effects. And you guys were, were pulling the Axe tones, Effect man. Three. Axe Effects 3. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me tell you the story about that. Yeah. Because uh, I'm so, you know, short of stories. <laughs> That's what we're here for, man. That, um... Okay, so I was at the guitar Melbourne Guitar Show a couple of years ago, uh, just kind of bumming around. Actually, I went I went to um to Charles's Charles Sillia's stand. Yep, and um you know did a bit of hanging out there, and um you know ran into a few guitar player mates there, and that was where I, I ran into. I oh, actually Brett and I played that day. Um, he and I played that day with uh, Shannon Bourne and. Uh, James Ryan, we did a did a bit of bit of jamming that day. It was pretty that was pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, um, I don't want to get off topic here. Okay, so I ran into Michael Dolce. For those of you who don't know who he is, you probably do, but you just don't. Um, you know, you gorgeous guitar player, lovely guitar player, lovely bloke. Um, anyway, he's like. He laid this rave on me about, and I was, you know, like I'm pretty, I'm a pretty nut, tough nut to crack when it comes to that shit. Like, yep. you know, I'm like, fuck off. Doesn't fucking sound like, it doesn't feel like, blah, blah, blah. He goes, look, just, I want to introduce you to this guy, Andrew Farnham from, um, uh, what's the name of their company again? Innov- um, innovative Music. In, in, 
Independent music? In- innovative. Innovative. In- I think. Or is it independent? Okay. There's two. There's two. Might be in- independent, innovative. There's there's two be. in Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it I might could... be independent. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, okay. We, we, get, we get to having a bit of a chat. And, um, and uh, at the time, there wasn't many of these, the three, kicking around. I'd played through the two. And um, look, I remember seeing Pete Thorne great guitar player who i have on the show a demo. I, have, I have i have pete on this Fantastic. thursday yes send him send him my regards we've we'll never actually met pete and i but we've we've emailed each other yep when i was working at bogner we emailed each other quite a few times he did some he's a phenomenal guitar player lovely guy you know monster guitar player um anyway andrew and i get chatting and he goes look i've got a three coming in he goes and the technology's a lot better he said i really reckon you should um uh, sorry, to complete the Pete Thorne thing, yep. he did a he did an A B, a blind A B. Yep. With the with the I think it was the two and his Marshall. Yep. And he said I, in the end he goes, I'm not going to tell you which one's which, because I think they're both they're both great. They feel slightly different. They feel slightly different, but uh and that was when my ears pricked up. I was like, huh. That the technology sight unseen looks like it looks tonically looks pretty good. So I, I kind of, the kind of, the door was ajar. And then I had a chat with Andrew, we had a pretty, pretty detailed conversation that night. And he was incredibly generous and forthcoming with, um, you know, uh, offering to, to send me one of these when they first um, came in. Mind you, at the time, um, Oh, someone's trying to call me again. Don't worry about That's it. That's okay, um, mate. I'm just checking time, who's, if it's independent or. Um, oh, great! It is okay. independent music. Independent. It is independent, um, music, um, independent music, mate. <clears throat> yep. Great. So, so at the, at the time, uh, so he sent me. Okay, so at the time, I was tooling up for these sons. Uh, they actually weren't sun shows. They were. Uh, it was a. It was one Jack Jones show at Palms. <clears throat> And that came out of that that show came out of a conversation that I had with my uh, manager, Darren Danielson, um, at Music Supplier. We'd have we'd had a chat, and I was putting this monster rig back together. I was fucking loving it. I was putting the rack. I was doing it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back out there with this rig. I'm going to show motherfuckers how this fucking sounds. Yeah. Like. I'm going to nail this shit to the wall like we used to do with the big rig and blah, blah, blah. I was very excited about that. And let me tell you, the rig was sounding pretty damn good too. <laughs> I bet. However, ha- however, that was a, it was a wet, dry, wet rig and you know, three quad boxes and I was ready to unleash the fucking fury of this rig, you know, because that music was – the opportunity for me to like come back sort of really, really paying homage to that time, you know? Yep. Anyway, it didn't take too long <clears throat> for me to, to discover that this was going to be quite problematic and it was going to be a, a pretty monumental undertaking to get this rig around the country. For a start, I couldn't move it on my own. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't fit it in anything in my car, I couldn't fit it anywhere. So it was going to become, look, it, it, it didn't take long to, to realize that this was going to be extremely impractical and problematic and, and potentially tr- troublesome. That, that, the, that, that, that there's a lot of, see what you forget is when you were touring back in the day, you had a lot of crew. And, you know, I had masterful guys working, not for me, with me at the time. And if things broke, they'd fix them. Mm-hmm. And they'd, they'd be having fucking meltdowns, like nervous breakdowns, because shit didn't work. And they were off getting, calling this guy, calling, getting tubes, getting da 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 you know. And my, my, my old rig had, at its, at its peak, you know, I mean, I had like three amps, two marshals, a, a fender, I had the X88R, you know, I had two PCM70, a, a one PCM70, two SPX90s, two D1500s, the H3000, uh, the PCM70, DBX160, the switcher, rain mixers, 
you know, the switcher itself, it was, it was a very elaborate rig. You know, all the, all the heads were loaded down and switching, but, you know, it was, and believe me. It's a lot things, of shit. That's a lot of shit. Things went, things, things went wrong. Like yeah. you get to the show and you're looking at your Bradshaw and no lights are on. Like, like, you know, because, because things had, things, things could go wrong. You're bouncing shit around on a, on a truck from Perth to Melbourne yeah. and then you're setting it up. It's just like taking it and, and just doing this for fucking a week yeah. and then just plug it in and look for the most part, it worked for the most part. We had a, we had a great system there. Anyway, I digress. I'm trying to just illustrate the, the scale of this, this rig, you know, yeah. cause I was, I really had a fucking point to make. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Andrew sent me the, um, Andrew sent me the Axe FX3. I did a session that day with it, and I'd never used it before. I didn't even change the presets. I actually used the Freeman presets. Yep. And I did this whole session with it, and I didn't even know how to get into the bloody thing. Like, I just scrolled around till I found a preset, that I, and his were the ones that just instantly were like, yep. Matter of fact, I did clean guitar parts by winding my volume back. Nice. Like it was, so I was like, huh, this is... This this worked in this environment. Anyway, I uh, he was like, we don't have the new foot pedals. Um, I said, well, do you, I, I, basically what I wanted to do was replicate that rig. I wanted to recreate that rig, and I said, this is. So I don't know how most guys are running this their setups with these, but I just want it to look like my old Bradshaw. Like when I look down on the floor, mm -hmm. I want to have a button for each effect that I'm using. And, you know, I want to be able to just switch things in and out in real time, click a delay in the middle of a solo, cut it out, whatever. Click a pedal, you know, jump on an Octavia. If I'm jamming with the boys at the end of a song, I want to be able to just have that random access uh, flexibility with this rig. And I pretty much want to have it fixed. I don't really, you know, I'm going to pick those three amps and I'm going to put my Soldano in there and that's going to be the rig, you know. Anyway, he didn't have any of the new foot pedals and they didn't have enough buttons anyway. And of course there was the conversation where it's like, you know, yeah, but we can, we can use the, you know, uh, you know, you can, with, with, with the less buttons, you can set it up this. I was like, you know what? I'm fucking not interested. I just want it to run like that. Cause yep. that's what I know. Yep. I'm old school. Yep. And I just want to look at it and you know, I just want to know what I'm, what I'm dealing with. Yep. Um, so he was like, Okay, let's. Uh, so he sent me an MFC 101, I think it is, the, the previous version. Yeah. Which isn't really plug and play. Yep. Right? It's not really plug and play. And it, was, it took a lot of fucking around. And Matt at, at, uh, at Fractal, who I met a few times, he remembered me and he was absolutely, I can't tell you how, how great he looked after me. He wrote a patch. He said, Tell me what you want. Yep. And I'll write the I'll write the patch for you. You load it up, and there's your template for every every song, and just nice. save it from there. And Andrew was I can't tell you how much how grateful I am to those guys because they really they really you know they, again these guys are dealing with Keith Urban, Steve Vai. You know, really, I'm fucking nobody. Who who like I'm but I'm like oh, I need this patch written for. <laughs> but he did it. Like I I shouldn't say I was like that. I was. Again, extremely humbled by the, the, um, the fact that he took the time to do it. And he did. And I started digging in. So I, I got a pair of the Atomic Wedges um, because, you know, they'd, uh, there, was a, there was a big um, – I, I, I didn't want to just use the, the, the house wedges of any, of any venue. I wanted to take, you know – take my own sort of thing along with me. So I started dialing this stuff in and it didn't take too long for me to realize, hmm, this sounds pretty good. Yeah. Like feels pretty good, sounds yeah. pretty good. And I'm still dialing it in. Um, you know, Pete Northcote was very generous with his time. He, he helped me out and um, gave me a lot of great tips and I'm thankful to him. Shout out to Pete Northcote. Um, you know, the first show, the first sound check that we did, 
I'll never forget hearing it come out of the PA. And I looked at Ricky Ray, our sound guy, and he just, he was, he had his hands up in the air. He was just like, couldn't believe it. And a mate, our mate Wazza was there, Warwick Newman, who does all diesel stuff, does all Mark stuff. Um, I'll never forget, <laughs> never forget finishing. I think we'd been jamming on the end of Shelter or something like that. And we finished, and I'll never forget, like, us ending at soundcheck and just hearing Wazza, and he was like, get fucked! <laughs> like, he just, he was, he was just, you could hear him, you know, screaming back. He was like, holy shit. Um, and then I realized, look, it's, um, it's a constant tweak. But you know what? I did that with my other rig any, mm. anyway. Mm. Mm. This thing, I can sit in the back of my car. I've, I, I sussed out how to get my wedges around the country. Like, I got two um, 22-inch bass drum cases. Oh, cool. I went down to Clark. I went down to Clark Rubber. I took my wedges down. I said, I need a, I need a circular piece of foam for the bottom and a circular piece for the top. And in the middle, I need you to cut this shape out. And they did it. And that's how, my, that's how those wedges get around the country. I've, nev- I've not had a problem with them. I generally take the uh, Axe effects uh, with me on the plane. Yep. Um, I don't. I tend to not check that through, but I know heaps of guys that do, and they have never. They've not had any problems with it. Um, and look, it takes a bit of a bit of adjustment. However, every night, it's so consistent. Mm. It's ri- ridiculous. And you know, anyone who's who's done, particularly these multi-band sort of gigs which is a lot of what we do these days you know um it doesn't take much for someone to walk run across the stage to be sorting somebody out and uh knock a microphone or move something or you've got to reset you know you take your stuff off they reset again it sounds completely different Mm. i don't have that worry ever and i love it i love it I'm wondering how much of that is to do with, um, I mean, it's you've got the modelling side of things, um, giving you all those virtual amps, but speaker IRs, um, talking to Steve yeah. Stevens a couple of weeks ago, Steve Stevens was saying yeah. that he's uh, now using the Boss um, tube amp expander uh, and he runs his amps into that and then feeds a, a direct line to, to front of house using... Um, speaker irs and that exact thing that you said of the sound guy just running down the front going fuck you gotta hear this oh, yeah, it's yeah yeah and and yeah, that just because yeah. if anyone's yeah. ever tried miking a speaker you know just those little minute it's it, it it's the difference oh, yeah. going, and you know just try, try and get oh, that yeah. to fit in the mix to have that consistency oh, yeah. and the image to, to you know you you you're that no spill, image, no spill. Image, no yep. spill. Yep. You just pull those, push those faders, and it's like fucking bang. So, uh, for the, look, for the most part, I'm absolutely loving it. You know, people say to me, you know, so are you going to sell everything? I probably won't because I still love just plugging the amp in and having them and playing through it. Totally. However, as far as as far as gigs are concerned, like, you know, am I going to ever take one of those big rigs out ever again? It, it's like. Probably not. Virtually, huh? it's, it's highly unlikely. Yeah, and right. it's highly unlikely that I'll ever, you know, the amount of shit backline stuff that is out there. Why would I ever take that chance when I can just put this under my arm? I'm very keen. I'm very, very keen to check out the new foot pedal version um, for just little kind of things. Yep. You know. Um, because it would be nice to be able to just um, – that would be one less piece sure. to take out. But I'm not going to have that, 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 um, that random access thing. And I don't know if I'm prepared to give that up. It's just a big – it's such a big part I hear of you. I hear you. I've actually got a – I don't playing. know if you can see over my shoulder yeah. there. I've got a, a foot controller. My chair's in the way. Uh, no, this way – I'll go get the fucking thing. Oh yeah, there it is. I, I saw a little. I saw a little. Uh, there we go. This is the kind of thing you're talking about, yeah, like, like that. 
Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. is that the custom audio? Like that's the that's the Bobby one, isn't that it? Is, that's the um, Rocktron. I bought that. Oh, Rocktron. Yeah, right. I bought that off Nine Inch Nails. Oh, you did? Yep. It's still got their markings hey, on it and everything. Look at that. Yeah. All access. Oh, lovely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm fog- fogging up my glasses here. I'm so excited. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, no, I totally get it. As you can see, I've got some racky here. I've always been a, a kind of a rack guy. Um, the ADA, the JMP1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. JMP1's a great sounding unit, man. I've used, I've used the JMP1 on, on a lot of sessions, man. Sound, it, it just sound really good. Yep. Um, so I, I'd really like to be um, using the Synergy gear with the with Bruce's Bruce Egnator's technology of slotting in the, the modules. And that. Botula. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm a broke musician, man, so I can't afford one right now. Uh, so, yeah, I've got a lend of the JMP-1. I might try incorporating that into a rig. But I was going to ask you, do yeah. you wear in-ears live? Yeah, I just recently got a new pair of um, the JH Audios, um, the Layla's. Hmm. Okay, tr- traditionally, I've, I've never been... Uh, a big rap for the in ears. Um, I think because in the early days I had some bad experiences with them, uh-huh. predominantly because of, but based on the operator, like it's yeah. you've got to have a great monitor guy. Yeah. For all the Suns gigs, I just used wedges. Yep. Um, and you know, for the most part, but you know, like all these Beatles sort of shows and things, that was pretty much what got me, got me into the uh, using ears because they really wanted to to bring down the stage volume you know you're playing with an orchestra so they wanted to take pretty much everything off stage um sonically uh which it takes a while to give to let go took me a while to let go because it's like something goes wrong you've got nothing yeah you can't run over to a uh a guitar player and listen to his amp to get pitch or so there's a huge sense of uh, a huge sense of trepidation and fear initially because it's like if something goes wrong we're, we're fucked pretty much you know you're really hanging out there on you're out there on your own yeah um but and for guitar it's a it's a real you know i still have my wedges yeah. on stage you gotta feel with it those in ear gear yeah. you gotta feel you gotta it feel so, it and i got those wedges point pointing straight back at me yeah. so i can have those things like blaring like and it, they you know it's it's no i've i've it's weird man because i used to have my quad box in front of me really pointing up at my face wow yeah but that's it's a it's a strange thing because quad boxes are so like directional absolutely just um they're really they're like a fucking laser beam Hmm. which is why you know people get hurt at gigs because you're like i can't hear it you know and people in the front row are like going yep yep you know and uh, you know when i when we used to do when i was when, when electric mirror was playing regularly and we were doing lots of shows together like you know I didn't really hold back volume wise in that band. I used to play pretty loud. The last time I played with that band with my boys in Sydney, my ears and this isn't something that I'm I don't I'm not particularly uh this isn't a badge of honor yep. to you folks out there, just so you know. But my ears rang like my ears were ringing so fucking loud after that gig that I couldn't hear anyone. Mm. Literally. People were talking to me from the other side of the band room and I just heard Woo! It was just, it, and you know, I woke up the next day and my fucking ears were ringing. Yep. Like that bad. And you know, you start thinking these things are important. Like, totally. Totally. I need this. I need this. I need these to, to, to do what I do. Yep. Um, do you, have you worn earplugs kind of over the years out. when you were playing really yeah. loud? Yeah. In the suns, in, in the suns, I used to wear earplugs and I used to alternate each night. Sure. So you got half the damage. You wear half the ears. damage. <laughs> well, you, well, I, I initially I did it because um, because I wasn't prepared to turn down, 
but I did want to hear myself singing. Like, but I was always too loud to, like, it was always a big ask for, um, but, you know, when you're the boss, everyone else just has to work around you. I don't mean that in a, it sounds cocky, but the reality is, is, you know what? You're not going to tell me to turn down at this gig. I'm playing how I want to play at this yeah. gig and it's fun. And that's what we all did. Yeah. And, we, and, and to, a, to a, you know, you don't want to be obnoxious. You don't want to play so loud that you ruin the experience. Yeah. But I like to feel it and I like to have it, you know. Um, so you, you said about so the, ringing, the ringing ears um, for that gig in, in Electric Mary. Is tinnitus a problem for you? No. No. It is no, for me, man. I, I totally is. It is? Oh, I'm hearing it now. I've got noise-cancelling headphones. If I turn those on, the noise-cancelling. Oh, it's not so bad today. It's not so bad today. That's okay. <laughs> I, was ho- I was hoping you were going to say, when I turn them on, I don't hear it anymore. <laughs> I wish. I wish, man. Uh, it's actually two frequencies. I sat, in, I sat with a, uh, an audiologist and we tried to work out, okay, now I'm thinking about it. it it's, it's loud again. It's two, yeah, you've got two to frequencies. Yeah, let's get out of this conversation, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm, oh, I'm... It can be distracting. It can be very distracting. And look, I've, I know some guys that ha- have it very bad. And, um, and I've, I've had extensive conversations with them about it. Like they've, they've all said to me that it's like this fucking zen thing. Like they've got to zone into this place where they're just at peace with this noise like mm. because it can actually if you fight it uh, it can really make you. you a bit it's like a fucking form of torture mm. it's it's like a you know it can be so you've got to just and look my ears my ears are ringing right now because you're talking I about think it they're only ringing because because we're talking about it yep. they don't ring all the, every day and I just think it, you know, it's a, it's very psychosomatic too. However, it's a real thing, yep. and you know, you, you've got to, um, if you've got it, you've got to, you've got to make peace with it. But I've been very lucky over the years, and and these days, uh, look, we, you know, back in the seventies uh, and the eighties, like there was. People used to play really loud. Uh, look, Electric Mary opened for Judas Priest. I couldn't, I couldn't go out the front of that gig. Wow! Without plugs in, it was that loud and that brutal. Like it was, oh, like ooh. Now I don't know what it was like on stage, but and you know you're not going to expect to walk out in front of Judas Priest and hear them be like, you know, it's got to be what it is, what it is, right? Um, but I, I think back in the day, you know, you were dealing with pretty crude sounds too like very raw and focused in a certain eq day in and day out like for months you got to remember there were this was we're talking about like when a lot of this damage was done to musicians that's when a world tour went for two years yeah like it's hard to imagine i know folks out there hard to but it's true you know, like even for us, like we toured for six and a half months one year, nonstop in Australia. That's when you had gigs that you could do. And we played two on one off, three on one off. And that was that. And, and you know what? The biggest break that we had was like five days. Wow. And there was, we recorded a song called Silent Witnesses. We'd done 10 shows in a row and the 11th day was our day off. And we recorded that song that day. Wow. And then we were back into it. Like, wow. it was pretty relentless. And that was when, you know, so it, it's sort of like, in a way, it's like the glory years. We, we, you know, we're reminiscing how great it was when we could do that much playing. Yeah. There was that many venues um, and stuff. But, you know, you've you got to have a, you've got to give those ears a, you know, they're these, full of these tiny little hairs, like tiny little fibers. It's, they're fragile, man, like your voice. Your yep. voice is, it, you got to, some people, I know cats that are just, their constitution, it, you know, someone like, like Farnsley. Yep. The guys, it's like uh, Jimmy Couple. Like these guys have indestructible voices. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's, you know, look, Keith, people were beating up, 
people were betting on Keith Richards dying in the 70s. Totally, totally. You know, the dude falls out of a fucking coconut tree and he's back on tour again. Like, yeah. the guy, he's just a... You know, some people just... Why won't you die? I got a friend like that, man. Still around, but I got a friend like that, Skitsy. They, they tried, they you just tried. can't fucking kill him. He's right. had that many car accidents mm-hmm. and fucking cancers and shit. And he just, you cannot, cannot kill the guy. Yeah, uh, they just, there's, there's people that have that. Oh, and I'm going to put the call out. If anybody is watching and has any questions for you, I haven't been keeping that much of an eye on the chat room because I like to give <coughs> my guests my full undivided attention. So if anyone's got any questions, um, throw them at me now before time gets away on us because I, I will round it up at three hours, mate, when we're fast approaching that. Um, Holy smokes, three hours? Yeah, really? man, I told you. Okay, I'm going right back to the start here. I'm hey, su- hey, Erwin, can you tell I'm us I'm surprised about- there's anyone in the chat room. <laughs> uh, mate, we've still got... Uh, it's down to 25 people watching now. We had uh, up around 40 at one, okay. one, one point. Uh, uh, yeah, all that guitar talk, mate. Yeah, weeded, yeah. Weeded out the... No, but they're, they're, uh, they're, they're guitar questions. Hey, Owen, can you tell us about mm-hmm. what you have in your guitar amp collection? Do you have any cool collector items? Any new axes being made for you anytime in the new fu- near future? And I'm going to go take a well, break as you answer that one again. Okay, so, uh, yeah. In my amp collection, I have a couple of... I've got a... Uh, Mark Kane, um, sort of Dumble style amplifier, which is an absolutely gorgeous amp. And I also have one made by uh, Mike Fu in um, uh, Tritone Amplification over there in Perth. Shout out to Mike and to Mark. They're both very, um, uh, very tasty amplifiers for that uh, in that uh, in that domain. I also have my Marshall, my uh, JTM45-100 that was modified by Dave Friedman. Uh, It's the B100 mod with a clean channel as well. Uh, I really, really like that amp. I've got an old uh, Marshall JMP that uh, has like a a Jose mod, which is a – that is just a bitchin' amp. Um, That's a a, – that's a that's a gorgeous amp. You just put a mic in front of it, and it just it records um, it records beautifully. Uh, what else uh, have I got kicking around? Oh, I've got a Mark Cameron Softec Mig 100 that um, that he modified, which is a that's a that's another one of those amps that you just put a mic in front of it. It just instantly sounds like it like it should. I've got a, a Bogner Goldfinger 90. Um, uh, I've got a little sort of Fender style uh, custom hand wired combo. Um, what else? There's a few other little things sort of kicking around. I've 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 culled my amp collection quite a bit. It still sounds like you've got quite a collection um, though. <laughs> I do. I do have a few. Well, you know, I still I still love a great amp. I still love a. I love the experience of just plugging into something and having a bit of a play. It and it's. Uh, just trying to think. I think I feel like there's feel like there's more, but um, but there there probably isn't. That oh, I've got an old Bogner that Reinhold made for me years, 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 years ago. It's two amps in the one chassis. It's oh, like nice. a hundred watt Vibra King and a fifty watt sort of Plexi that is like his Plexi. Um, and that's a that's about forty five kilo, forty five, forty eight kilos. It's a very can't take it anywhere you know yeah, any, yeah. anymore but that's a that's a very unique that's a real unique amp and i, I love that so it looks like uh it's industrial you know it's, he's used uh, an ecstasy chassis and he's just kind of you know but he, he, we we spent a lot we spent a couple of nights like a couple of all-nighters on that amp before i left to come back here with it and and tweaking you know tweaking it you know twitching out parts and like kind of like what I did with Dave uh, Friedman, and you know Dave Ulbrich. I, I should have mentioned him earlier. Like he's another, he's a guy that that really um, was a huge part of my, uh, you know that that uh, that tweaking amps 
sort of journey. Mark Van Gool, who's a who's a great guitar player, guitar tech in LA. He's done heaps of stuff, everything from Daft Punk to um, you know Bon Jovi. Um, he's just absolute sweetheart of a guy too. Mark Van Gool, check him out. Um, and custom guitars, yeah. Charles is Charles is building the. Um, we got a couple of couple of strats. So we're refining. There's going to be an ultra ultra light uh, swamp ash. Uh, bird's eye, uh, swamp ash, play maple neck. With his custom pickups in it that is just uh, it's going to be an absolute corker. And then there's the Floyd Rose kind of hotter version of that, which is um, a light older body with uh, flame flame maple neck as well. Um, and I'm I'm definitely leaning towards the compound radius. You know, I hate when I say that because it it sounds like so modern. Yeah. But really, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is, you know, is, you know, when you play a Sir, like I love John and his, you know, he builds incredible guitars, incredible amps. I love that guy. I'm a huge fan of what he does, and a big part of why his guitars, I mean, a big part of the playability of those guitars is, um, is that compound radius. Uh, you know, it's it it really has a certain, um a workability uh, about it that I, I do like. And I like a guitar that feels, it's weird because it still feels vintagey to me. Mm-hmm. It's not that harsh as you go up the neck, but when you want to do like a bend, when you want to bend like two tones up the top, it's very hard to do that with a, with a strat radius. Sure. It's just, it's, so, it's, it, it's hard to get a guitar set up that we can go. Woo, woo. It's just so hard yep. um, without it fretting out and just, you know, just kind of choking. So, so that's we've been working on that guitar for a few years now, um, and I think we I think I think we've nailed it. Um, nice. I think we've we've nailed it. It's a great hot strat. It's a great modern sort of strat that sounds very vintagey. If you if while well, there is a vintage kind of version, it's two versions of that guitar. There's the standard tremolo, you know. I don't even maybe we'll do a maybe maybe we'll do that as a three single coil guitar. V-shaped sort of profile neck. Um, maybe we'll do that as a more standard sort of strat. But again, with all the trimmings of, um, you know, spur cells, like locking. I even have the locking nuts on my Floyd Rose guitar. Yeah, yeah. Just quick and easy, because huh? Because it's just so quick. Just quick. Bam. Yeah. You know, you change that string, lock the fucker off. Bam. Off you go. Yep. You know, it's, yep. it's good. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, uh, the other got, they've all got the bright capacitors on them. The, the first tone for the, is for the front and middle pickup. I've got the, the second tone wide to the bridge pickup so that I can have a different, you know, and there's a push, push, push on, um, on that, on the, the, the second tone as well, which gives you a, you know, it's not a, it, it, it doesn't split. It doesn't, I don't think it splits the bridge pickup, but I think it, it runs it in series or parallel or something. It makes it, it's it's not as quacky. I don't really like that fourth position, really really quacky sound. Okay. Like I I I much prefer this. Well, when I say fourth position, I I mean first position being neck. I don't know how some people yeah sure you know, sure yep. on a five way they they yep. talk about the other way. Yep. But first position being neck, neck and middle, middle, middle bridge, bridge. Yep. Um, but I really like how that humbucker, how his humbucker sounds in that split position it's very stringy um but it's not it's not uh it's not brittle and and sort of pissy which is what a lot of humbuckers sound like when you split them sure they they just they, do, they just they? sound weak yeah. and and fucking noisy yeah. and it's pretty much unusable so for me it's about getting the most out of the instrument getting the, the best sort of variety of tones and having a lot of flexibility at your hands but it looks pretty stock you know because you just you just want you just want it to be a you know it's just I don't want a bunch of buttons and shit on my guitar yeah, and yeah. stuff I just I just want to look at it and go yeah hello hi old friend well I'm gonna be ringing up uh, so Charles go. I'm gonna call Charles I'm gonna call him this afternoon and see how I can get my hands I, on one I saw Dave I saw Dave give him a give him a beautiful shout out shout out and wow. I I have photos of of his of Dave's guitar before it was even. Like when it was in pieces, really? before it even finished it. Yep. Um, I've got a photo of my missus holding the, the neck that has Friedman in the 12th 
you know. Nice. Um, and that the, the block inlay, you know, on the yep. 12th fret. Yep. So I think so. So you know, I showed you that guitar before. So like the, I think there'll be my logo, my IT logo, on the 12th fret um, as well. But we, you know, I don't want to make it too sort of wanky. I, I don't know. It's just um, it'll just be. It's just a little way to sort of say this is a signature series guitar. Um, we've been working on that guitar for a, for a long time. So I'll be. Um, we were hoping to release it at the guitar show this year, but because of this whole thing, you know, um, looks like it'll be next year. So, sure. um, but the guitars will be out before then. Cool. Uh, and you know, you can custom order custom order those guitars now if you want. I think I will. Mate, we've got another a few more questions here. Um, where did I see it? From Steve Roberts. Just wondering if you could play with any musos these days, who would you most want to jam with? Abe Laboreal Jr. Um, I just saw I just saw a clip of Abe Jr. No. Um, okay, my battery. Oh, I just had this. I don't yep, know if you heard that. I did, did hear that? that. I did hear that. <laughs> Jeez, a chick's yelling at me, telling me that. Telling me low battery. So look, if you lose me, I'll put my other ones in. Yep, yep, that's um, fine. Uh, we're we're running up to the three hour mark. Yeah, man, we'll we'll, we'll round it up. I, I want to get you back on, man, because um, we'll, we'll get love, you back. I'd love to time. come back on, and I would, I'd love to play with Abe Junior. I really, I I, I declared, um, uh, you know, in this in the spirit of of um, manifesting your, the things that you want to do in life, and and manifesting your. your making things become real just by your thoughts and, and how you get up every day and live into your world. Um, I, in the next five years, I'd really love to make a record with Abe Jr. I'd love to have him on, a, on an album. I just, I just adore that guy's playing. Um, cool. And, and, uh, and I'd love to, I'd love to immortalize, you know, ma ma make a, make a, a great record with that guy. I'd, I'd just love to do that. So that's, I'm committed to doing that. He's, he's the, He's the main guy uh, for me. I mean, obviously, uh, there's other other guys out there as well. But Abe Jr. is the guy that immediately I go, yeah, I want to make a record with that guy. Play nice, me. nice. I, I've just quickly scanned through the, the questions, um, and I know you are about to run out I'll of I'll try of and keep juice. my answers. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and keep my answers short. Uh, a few of the things there you have actually answered along the way, but there's one here. What was the humbucker in the White Charvel? That's it was an memory. SH5, and it was a... And it was a, um, and it was a, it was an SH5 out of Phil's guitar that he played on the state record. Cool, SH5. That's so not a, Seymour that's, Duncan. That's not a JB, is it? That's an S, SH4. No, it's it's a, it's a hotter. It's hotter than the JB. It's the next one up. Okay. And it was a quite mid-range voiced um, sound, and that that pickup into the X88R was a great combination. It was just. It's pretty hot, pretty hot pickup and pretty mid rangey but very 80s, early 90s tone, you know, saturated sound. It was a very, it's a very great, it was a great pickup. I don't know how, where that pickup ended up, actually. I, I ended up going to back to past and things like that. And that's, I just... I've lost you, man. Uh, I've lost, uh, yep. This one's going to. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you, you, Hang on. No, 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 no. Hang I've on. got you, Don't I've go. got you. Don't go. I've got you. Stand by. That's okay. I can still Stand hear by, you now. Okay. Let's see if we get love here. Okay. How's that? I, I had you. I had you. <gasps> yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're back. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I like that. A little All bit. Right. Little bit. So, um, so, yeah. Keep going. We're good. Uh, no, no. So, that, that's it. So, I'm, I'm pretty much back to – look, Seymour – I met Seymour Duncan at, a, um, at one of the AMA shows – and um, and uh, and I'd still love to. He offered to wind me some pickups, and I would still love to get uh, some of. Like I'd still love to to um, to have him wind me some pickups one day um, in that in that style. But you know, I, I've just I've gone back to that path, low output, you know, um, open sort of bridge pickup, almost a cross between like a P90 and a humbucker, which is sort of how those classic paths sound to me. You know, they, they're stringy, but there's no noise and they're kind of fat, but not, but they're open. They're wide open, you know? So, yeah. Now, there is a question here, and I don't know if this is actually doable, that, seeing that you're using the sound off your in-ears, but Nick Kane is saying, time for one acoustic tune. <laughs> now, look, I've, um, 
I made a uh, I made a commitment when this whole weird COVID thing happened uh, that I wasn't going to what Reggie and I call leave skid marks on the internet sure. of um uh, and look don't get me wrong I'd love to play your song I'd love to do it but I'd also love it to sound good and and uh and that might you know people might think that that's a bit wanky or whatever but held out for this long but but don't worry there's two records coming so um but you know yeah I'm sorry I'm not going to play a song today but we uh, but if he's got any gear gear questions mate fire away and I'm yep. all yours yep totally I see my mate Link has just come back in so yeah we, I'm going to round things up if anybody has any more questions but we were talking earlier about when you stayed at um at with Dweezil um yeah did you get obviously you would have had a play of the burnt Hendrix Strat, yeah? I, I, I did. And you know what? You remember when I was talking about he, we went down into the studio and he was playing his um, EVH into the, into the Marshall that he found? Mm -hmm. I, he handed me the Hendrix Strat and so I, I had a bit of a play through it. And it's, it's incredible, man. Like this is when you realise that it's all in the hands because it actually didn't sound that great when I played the the – the it, his, his Eddie Van Halen guitar into the Marshall. He was playing and ripping this fucking Van Halen shit. It was like, wow, it was amazing. And then I played it, fucking didn't sound that good. Yeah, right. Like it didn't, it didn't sound anything like that. But then, so, but he handed me the Hendrix Strat and he plugged it into a matchless that actually the, the chassis was bent and the, the, the head shell was, was fucked because there'd been a, if we'd had an earthquake and it had fallen off, oh. fallen off his amp and, and, and gone crunch, but it was still working. And I'll never forget him saying, see, man, that guitar and that amp with you, that's your sound. And I went, yeah, you're right. It was. That was – and I played that guitar quite a bit. I, I loved playing that guitar. It was great fun. It was great fun. I was, there's just something about, you know, when you pick up a guitar like that, there is mojo in it and there's something – there's a huge story, of the backstory, you know, about that guitar. Dave People Leslie. People don't know it, they can look it up. Dave Leslie told me he licked yeah. that guitar when, <laughs> when nobody was looking <laughs> to try and absorb some of the DNA. Um, well, now, what, you know what? what year would that have been, man? What year would that have been? That I was there? Yeah. When I was there? Mm -hmm. It would have been, it would have been 96, okay. maybe. Because in 95, you had a burnt Strat. I remember... I got a photo. Yeah, that, I, well, I used that at the Australia Day concert. Yeah, you had a burnt strat, and I've got a photo that you took of me playing, uh, holding that guitar. And mm -hmm. I, want, I want to show you something, man, because you inspired. Huh? Well, between that and the Hendrix, um, that inspired this. I'm going to show you. All right, I'm going to uh, put my um, put my glasses on here. Hey! <laughs> There you go. This is my burnt strap, there man. I just pull this out of the way a bit. How? Oh, that's got a nice big fat neck on it. It does. It? it does. Like you can see there, that's a full I can see. one inch thick. That's got some. That's got some shoulder. Some shoulder on it. And it used to be a V. It. That used Lovely. to be a V. Uh, and I, I rounded uh -huh. out the V a little, but it's a big fat warmth neck. That is a um, Fender Highway One. Show me about that light there. Let me just close that blind. That's all right. How did you do that? Did you do that with a blowtorch? Because that's how we did mine. Okay, hopefully, uh, we'll see it a bit better now. I set fire to the motherfucker, man. It was a black. Yeah, you did. A, a oh, black. Yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then hit it with. Um, hang, I'll finish my sentences first. I'm getting confused. I think hit the back was. Yeah, so it started out as a, oh, a black lovely. Fender Highway 1. Um. Which Four is strings. a nitro Five finish, strings. nitro finish over a poly. So I put the old lighter fluid on it, and I there you go. Phew, up it went. That did half the job, that's and then I it. and then I hit it with a yeah. um, with a heat gun afterwards just to take a bit more off. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Nice but, job, mate. Yeah, nice I gotta job. say <laughs> that was very much inspired by um, by your axe and and the Hendrix axe. Uh. But yeah, got the well, spurtles that, and that, all that, the that, lockings. Yeah, lovely. Well, that set the tone for all of us. You know, we kind of we um, and that was sort of pre relics. That was that was pre, um, you know, when that was that was before you could buy a guitar that looked like 
it had been, um, you know, played and, and toured and, and, like, worn in. Now it's all the, you know, it's all the fucking rage. People want to buy guitars that look that look like you've used them for years. Yeah. The first thing, I, first thing I'd do when I got a new guitar is put a knock in it. The first, the first thing I'd do is I'd go bang, and then I'd go, okay. That's out of the way. Can... Yeah. I gotta say, yeah. that's out of the way because yep. you know, man. From the from the moment I got my first electric guitar, I still have the body of it back there. It's in pieces, but it was an Onyx Strat copy. I bought. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a tuner. I had a pitch pipe, and I went to tune my fucking guitar. <laughs> had it in my mouth and went <clears throat> straight on my guitar. Take a fucking chip out of it, and I was just like, oh, oh God. yeah. And I'm you know young poor kid. You know, mum's just fucking been scrubbing toilets at the caravan park I lived at to fucking afford to buy this for me, and I scratched yeah. the motherfucker. You know, yeah, big ding out of it, out of the body. Oh, um, man. And ever since then, <laughs> whenever I get something new, if it's too shiny, yeah, fucking oath, man, straight up, you'll you'll do something. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be too keen to do that on an old guitar if I bought it. Um, but uh, but I do, I do feel like with new guitars, they need a bit of, uh, you know, they need to, you need to, like like a lot of new guitars feel quite uh, green. So, because you get used to this this old sort of, you know, they take the lacquer off the neck, and that's a very, that's a very playable kind of good feel, you know. It's um, you know, they just they just uh, look. It's a, it, it it instantly makes you comfortable playing those relic guitars because you're not afraid of anything, you know. It's not like you're going to notice another ding in a guitar like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Owen, yeah. I got to say, man, you it's been quite a, a journey since getting your lessons with Tony Calabro as an 11 year old, you, yeah, you've, you've opened up yeah. a, I think you've told a great story today, man. I really thank you for letting us in. Thank I, you. The, the Irwin oh, Thomas. So I've never told uh, uh, a lot of that stuff. I've never, never spoken about. So yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for the therapy session. I appreciate it, brother. It checks in the mail, man. Uh, man, I'd love to have you back <laughs> on. Uh, I'd love to have you. Uh, love to have you back uh, on, man. Look, um, there's, there's, there's easy another three hours of, uh, bullshit that i could spin for oh, another, totally. you know like I'd, I'd be happy to do it i love it i mean there's great there's so many i'm already thinking now of like oh god i didn't talk about this yeah. no, there's just there's just so much stuff in there like touring with richard marx and which know, is uh, something Tina arena and which is something that my friend uh, link asked about when i was going through the questions there um oh yeah he was just asking I just have to go from memory. I did see it come up there. He was just asking what it's like for you to actually just play guitar and lend backing vocals to someone like Richard Marks, as opposed to actually fronting the band. I love it. I love it. And I, and you know what? I'm always up for doing, if it's the right thing, I'm always up for doing it. You know, I did a uh, 2005. I did some, I did about eight months on and off of um, Daniel Bedingfield and um, in, uh, in and around Europe and London. I, I love doing that. And it, and for me, it, Look, I, it's a service industry. Like when I'm a hired gun, I'm just ha- I'm there to serve and I'm there to just just make the artist happy. And with Richard's gig, you know, I really wanted to be faithful to uh to a lot of. The, and you know, of course, there's all my favourite guitar players that played on those records. Now Richard does slightly different versions of those songs, but um, I did I I was very pretty keen to to um to to. To, for us to reach back to those other slightly other versions of those songs um, because uh, you know but look you just want to make the artist happy and and it's a fun you know I hope I hope that I bring something to the table with those gigs and I've I always love doing them I always leave them with something new and I always love bringing something to the table uh, with with those you know and you always you meet different players um, you know if it's an international gig you it opens, you know. When I started playing guitar, a big, uh, a big, a huge part of the appeal was to become part of this musical community. All these guys that were my mentors and my peers that I grew up listening to, um, you know, sitting in a car with Buzzy Feet and, you know, playing playing tracks. It's pretty amazing, you know, driving around with Sterling Ball in my car, you know. Talking about music and and you know, 
And it just sounds like I'm like throwing names around here, but the reality is, is that was that was a big part of of um, not even playing with them, but just to kind of just, just to be in this, yeah, doing the hang, man. It's it's and so I enjoy doing that, and I love I love you know I've made some great friends over the years, um, and uh, you know some pretty lo- lasting relationships through through those experiences, and I'm always keen to always keen to do it. You know, I'm not a 19-year-old guitar player who's going to go out and play for, um, you know, look, at the, for the most part, a lot of the gigs that I do, I do for nothing anyway. But, you know, I, you know, you know I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those guys that can go out and play, you know, you know, play for nothing these days unless it's a little gig around town. You know, I can't go on tour for nothing. So, yeah. so you know, we like to have our own room and stuff like that. But, uh, but I'm not that demanding and I, and I love the experience. And, yeah, for the most part, that was what I – what got me into music so you know why wouldn't i still love doing it and and you know what there's nothing like standing up on stage i got richard uh, i mean the great the, before we just winding up when we were rehearsing for richard's tour he um he walked in the rehearsal room when we were when we were playing and he was like he's the minute we stopped he started singing lead me to water he was like oh my god i'm like what you know that song? Like, I'd forgotten that Phil and he and John and stuff had written together. And, you know, I just sort of, you know. And anyway, he was like, yeah, man, that album was on, like, high rotation when it, in my house when it came cool. out. And I was, you know, blown away by that. And to be able to stand up on stage with that guy and, and play all those, uh, play all his hits, um, you know, with my mates, with Phil Tercio and Pete Bolliker and Jerry Pantazas, you know, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a wonderful. It was a wonderful couple of weeks of, of doing shows, and you know, you you realise how many hits that guy's fucking had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's not not only his own hits, but hits that he's written for other people. I could tell you a couple of stories, but I won't because they'd be I'd probably be talking out of school. But you know, he he wrote he wrote one of his one of a, a song that was a big hit for him. He wrote for someone else, and they knocked it back. And I was and he told me that he'd written it for this person, and he said they knocked it back, and I was like really and he goes yeah and i go so what you just decided well fuck it i'll have a number one hit with it and he kind of goes yeah <laughs> wow there you go and he did and he did it's a big song for him but one of his big songs yeah so look you know you, to, to have those experiences is great and um you know I, I feel again i feel blessed and very fortunate and very 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 uh you know, humbled by by the fact that I get to do that, and um, and I hope I get to keep doing it because that's what that's what gets me up in the morning. You awesome. know, awesome. We've had a suggestion here that when yeah. you come back, maybe we make it a um, a, an Irwin and Brett Garcia double chat. Woo! That's an well, idea, man. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Done. Yeah. I'm down for that. I'm cool. down for that because you're totally the two guys that have, we've had. Um, over three hours of, of chatting with a lot more to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I want just both stories. I want just both back for individual episodes, anyway, man, because it's just great catching up with folks and having a good old rave. Yeah, I love it. And it's great to it's great to see you, man. And look, I know we're I know we're winding it up. So, but but you know, congratulations, well done. This is a it's a big thing to do this, and um, and uh, you know, I think you're doing a great job and. It's uh, it's it's great for guys to be able to, you know, tune in and listen to cats talk about because this this stuff we don't really talk about hmm. in any other interviews that we sort of do, sure. you know. And it's nice to just sit here and be candid and talk about stories of, you know, uh, uh, talk about a lot of stuff that you don't really that no one really asks you about. Yep. Yep. So um, so congratulations. Well, thank mate. you, mate. Well done, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. I told you as I go into these, I don't actually have questions. I start off with how you got started, yeah. and. I get a little whiteboard as you're talking. Mm-hmm. I take notes so that my next question <laughs> relates to what you're talking about and nice. not, not completely different. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm hoping to keep the momentum up. Um, and, yeah, it's been a lot of fun, man. It's been nice. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, pleasure. Cool. Pleasure. Anytime, so, brother. Anytime. Yeah, folks, big thank you to Owen. A little a round of applause there. You can't hear that, but we all can. And I'm going to hit my magic button with the end screen because my end screen is so damn cool. I'm going to hit it. 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 Bam.